idiots. Primary means they are idiots. There is no obvious cause of it. Many people ask me, Mr. Manakem, my simple answer is Bhagwan Nigift Chai. Exactly. And the most commonest of these headaches are the migraines. The second are tension type headaches. Eighty percent of the headache open comprises of these two headaches, the migraines and the tension type. The third group in primary is called as TAC. TAC is trisomino autonomic technologies. And last is the others. Since others are not very significant, very rare, I have just finished them in a slide. But they are related to certain situations. Many times you will see the patient has headaches with cough, headache with sexual activities. Hypnic headaches are very rare and pressure headaches. So these, these are situation related headaches. They are primary and they are benign. So I won't further delve into that. The secondary headaches obviously which are not primary, which are related to some, some problem happening in the brain. It could be following infections like meningitis and intracranial pathology is cropping up following trauma, following strokes, following various ENT causes, the teeth and the psychiatric causes. Now it is extremely important to differentiate between a primary and a secondary headache. Otherwise it can be catastrophic. So according to the I International classification of headache, they have given an acronym called SNOW4, which involves the presence of systemic symptoms, systemic science, neurological science, and different criteria. But as I said yesterday, I don't like this acronym business. So I have simplified it in my own way. And I have called them as the red flags. And I think so this should be the first take home message for all those who are dealing with headaches. The first and the simplest is that any new onset of headache, in particularly after the age of 50, please be careful. You might be dealing with certain sinister diseases. Any new headaches in pregnancy any new headaches with some neurological deficit or systemic symptoms and signs. Like if a patient has headaches with vomiting, with fever, he can. Headaches, vomiting with hemiparesis or dysarthria, be careful. So any patient with systemic signs and symptoms, be careful. And thunderclap. Thunderclap is just like as you clap, all of a sudden, snap like pain. Be careful. Headaches with change of postures, headaches with straining. And if a patient has headache, but his character has changed, the frequency has changed, the duration has changed. So, when you the patient, you say, Pella no dukhao, aathro judo or the frequency was he At least a cliff not either. Be careful. So deep, remember these red flags and never neglect these patients. Just a bit of bit on thunderclap headaches. As I said, thunderclap headaches comes like you know, as you clap, all of a sudden snap. And these are certain causes of thunderclap headaches, which probably won't interest you much. But yes, one should be aware of subarachnoid hemorrhage, one of the most dangerous diseases you are dealing with. Cortical vein thrombosis can come like this. The dissections can come. 
pituitary apoplexy I have seen two cases coming in this way. So just look at the onset of the ache and if it is thunderclap, investigate. Now coming back to the primary headaches, as I said first, the most commonest is the migraine and then migraine is further subclassified. So you have headaches, primary, secondary, facial pains, then in primary you have migraine, tension type, TAC and others and now in migraine you have common migraine, migraine with aura and then there is further classification. So the classification goes down, down, down but that is more for research people. Our classification will end here. One is migraine without aura, that is called as common migraine and second is migraine with aura, that is called as classical migraine. 90% of the patients have migraine without aura and 10% of the patients have classical migraine that is migraine with aura. But mind you, a patient of common migraine can have classical and a classical migraine can have. So one can have a combined kind of picture. There are three terms if you are dealing with headaches you should also know. One is the common migraine, chronic migraine. <coughs> Second is status migranosus and third is MOH. MOH is medication overuse headaches. I think so, you know the treatment and the approach of MOH, the medication overuse headache becomes quite different <coughs> from that common migraine. I will delve into that in detail further. These are the diagnostic criteria of common migraine, but I will not go into the diagnostic criteria. I will just explain you. As I said yesterday, we, we are taught to pick up the patterns. So I will tell you the pattern of different kinds of headaches. And my simple rule is that if a patient doesn't follow the pattern, investigate. That is the way I have probably avoided missing several conditions which are serious. So how would a patient of common migraine present to us? <coughs> Usually a female, maybe young female of 30, 40, with intermittent recurrent headaches since several years. The headache is usually unilateral, throbbing or pulsating. When you the patient take a nurse fully dies. It gradually starts, builds up over a period of one to two hours and the duration is more than four to seventy-two hours. These headaches are associated with nausea or vomiting and photophobia and phonophobia. Photophobia, phonophobia is called avaj nagar, light nagar. They prefer silence and dark. And if somebody disturbs, irritability ensues. So unilateral, throbbing, pulsatile headache gradually building up over a period of 4 to 72 hours associated with nausea and vomiting, maybe photophobia and phonophobia. And many times it is relieved with vomiting or going to sleep. So this, this is the pattern. The frequency can be variable. It can be once in a month or two or we have seen patients those who have almost 10 to 15 attacks a month also. So this is a pattern of common migraine. The second is migraine with aura, classical. The difference is that these patients have an aura prior to the headaches. The auras are quite variable. The commonest aura is visual scotomas. Patient is zigzag lights they have, black and white dots they have. They are called as visual auras. Some people have sensory auras. Some people have, as for example, there is a brainstem aura. So there might be dysarthria or dysphagia before. So this aura starts 
builds up over a period of 5, 10, 20 minutes and then the headache starts. And then the headache is similar to what we dealt with in common migraine, unilateral pulsating, gradually building over a period of 4 to 72 hours with nausea, vomiting, photophobia and follow. The difference is presence of aura which gradually builds. Have you heard about Alice in the Wonderland? Do you know the author Louis Caron was inspired by his aura, aura of migraine. In that, he had an aura of micropsia. It was badi was to nani thing. And from that inspiration of his own migraine with aura, he wrote down this story, Alice in the Wonderland, where the Alice shrinks, becomes small and then plays with different animals. So, this is how somebody has used his aura to write down a story about it. So, when you have a patient with aura, remember you might have to differentiate it from a TIA or from an epilepsy. As for example, a patient with visual scotoma, it could be an epilepsy coming from the occipital lobe. Or if a patient has brain stem aura with dysphagia and dysarthria and headaches, you will have to think about brain stem ischemia with dissection of the vertebral artery. So, this is another very important point which you should know that whenever we are dealing with an aura, be careful. You have TIAs and epilepsies knocking your doors. Chronic migraine will be later on. Amherge. This is medication overuse headaches. The history is patient has gana varsho this have matu dukhe. And matu dukhe it will get it by the way. But she art does collect sadure. But she furry the headache comes. And I again take the tablet. And this cycle goes on and on. So patient consumes two to three tablets of an all day, six per day and this is going on for three months, six months. Now this is called as medication overuse headaches. The definition criteria is use of analgesics for more than 15 days a month or triptans for more than 10 days a month for three months. But the approach here will be different than the approach of management of common migraine. So one should know that whether we are dealing with simple common migraine or we are dealing with MOH. <coughs> Vestibular migraine, yeah, it is a bit confusing one. But usually an adult comes with vertigo. And vertigo, as you know, it can be of any sort. It can be momentary, it can be positional, it can be confusing of any kind. But these patients have past history of migraines. So any adult who comes with history of vertigo, one should inquire about past history of migraine. And with this vertigo, there would be some features of migraine. If not headache, then nausea and vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia would be there and unilateral throbbing headache would be in fact, I was reading somewhere and they said that, that in any patient of Menias disease, before you operate upon, give a trial of prophylaxis of migraine. So before operating any patient of Menias disease, it might be worthwhile giving a trial of management of migraine. Sir, not in Menias only, in any undiagnosed vertigo patient. Right. This would give mighty migraine. Fine enough. So I think so. Migraine might fox us, might confuse us with what I do, and one should give a trial of anti-migraine treatment. <coughs> the tension type headaches. Once again, I will not go into this slide. I will explain you the pattern of tension type headaches. Again, usually a female with history of chronic headache, three months, six months, two years, five years. 
the headache is bifrontal on the vertex, continuous. It is not pulsatile or throbbing like that of migraine. It is not unilateral like that of migraine. It is not associated with nausea and vomit. So just the dull, aching, continuous headache, bifrontal over the vertex, which is going on and on. And then you know probably you are dealing with a tension type headaches. If you can pick up tension type headaches and common migraine, 80% of the job is done. Now the tax, tax, tax it means trisamine autonomic cephalia. These are uncommon headaches. But I am sure these, these patients do come to you people. These patients have TAC. TAC means there is a dysautonomic changes in the trisaminal distribution. So the patient can have meiosis, patient can have lacrimation, patient can have rhinorrhea, patient can have periorbital and facial swelling. So a headache with TAC the features of dysautonomia on the face are these three or four. The clusters, the paroxysmal hemicrania, the sun and hemicrania contain. Cluster is the most commonest of this. And sun is by and large a differential of trigeminal neuralgia. And I'm sure a lot of ENT people are seeing trigeminal neuralgia. So sun could be a differential of trigeminal neuralgia. Again, I will describe you the character of the pattern of cluster headache. Cluster means I hope everybody knows good show. It comes in her. So the history is usually male, usually young male, who is fine. And all of a sudden, he gets maybe right temporal pain. Severe, throbbing, vascular, but no nausea, no vomit. It peaks within an hour and settles down in three to four hours. And it is usually side locked. It doesn't change like that in my case. So the differentiating first point is the duration, one to four hours. Second, far more severe. Third, no nausea and vomit. Presence of trigeminal autonomic cephalic changes. And another point is periodicity. We aaje ratre das vage thayu, to again kale ratre das vage. It will come. And it will come daily for five, 10, 15, 30 days. And then the headache is gone. So it has come in cluster of 10, 20, 30 days. And then the headache is gone all of a sudden. And after 3 months, 3 years, 5 years, again the headache comes in the singular way. Bang, bang, bang for 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, 30 days. And again the headache is gone. So it comes in clusters. Another important differentiating point from migraine is a patient of migraine prefers solitude. Light of and under. Here the patient becomes restless. Many times the patient will bang his head on the wall. And this headache is called a suicidal headache. I have one patient of cluster who did suicide from months ago. And the management of cluster is different from management of common migraine. So always make it sure that you don't miss cluster. I think so I very simply simplified the entire stuff. And secondly, large number of clusters can be secondary. Any lesion around the cavernous and the pituitary, whether the vascular, structural, tumor, malignancy infection will have a picture similar to cluster. So it is very imperative to look into those areas when you are handling a patient of cluster.
this was the slide which probably I always try to place in front of EMTs and medicine people. Everybody wants to know about common migraines, tension diabetes. But I think this this area or this slide tells you about the other challenges that we see. Like let me give you an example. You have a patient with pain over the angle of TM joint, angle of jaw. What can be the difference? First comment I want to say that all pain in this area are not trigeminal. Please remove that misconception. A pain at the angle of jaw could be glossopharyngeal neuralgia. It could be a pathology from cervical C234. It could be an angina also. A pain around ear could be a PM joint problem, which is very commonly missed. PM joint arthrosis or arthritis is extremely missed, commonly missed, be it ENT surgeons or dentists, everybody. I think we should pay more attention. Everybody looks at the teeth, dentists say, that bada karo but he doesn't look at the teeth. Then there is a superficial temporal artery here. If you are dealing with a headache <coughs> in a male above the age of 50, always look at superficial temporal artery. Get the ESR and CR. Otherwise, this man might land up with blindness anytime in future. This could be superficial temporal arteries. That is why I said any new headaches beyond the age of 50. Be careful before putting a diagnosis of migraine. It could be superficial temporal artery. A glaucoma would come. So these, these kind of things, uh, sunk type, just tell you. Sunk is something similar to trigeminal neurology of V1, the first division of neurologic pain in V. There are a large number of patients those who come with a retroauricular pain. Mind you, it could be a cortical vein thrombosis. A transverse sinus and a sigmoid sinus thrombosis would come with retroauricular pain. A C1, C2 arthrosis. There are so many degenerative C1, C2 arthritis patients will come with retroauricular pain. And there is another now called greater occipital nerve. A greater occipital neurology can come with retroauricular pain. So there are so many causes the vascular, the joint, the teeth, the cardiac, the neuralgias, the cervical. So just all pains are not trying. Just we'll have to dig a bit more to find out what you are dealing with in these cases. And this is just the copy and paste from the textbook of the same what I mentioned you before. Different causes of otalgia which are beyond so I think so with this, I will lay down the basic classification in different types of headaches and the clinical presentation. So how, how would I investigate a patient of headache? Frankly, CT scan has only value in acute conditions. When you are dealing with trauma and you want to look at blood. In fact, I was reading somewhere where they said that 50% of the CT scans done in US are useless. They are not indicated. And I am sure the scenario would be the same in our country. So CT scan in headache, only two situations. Acute with trauma and subretinal hemorrhage using water. Otherwise, avoid doing CT scans. MRIs are to be done. And when you are suspecting a vascular pathology, Go for both arterial and venogram. And in arteriogram, go for both the extracranial and the intracranial. You might be dealing with dissection, which probably might be much lower. And if you are dealing with periauricular pain, you might have to take advantage of MRI face and soft tissue of the neck also. 
if you are dealing with thunderclap headaches, the CT angio has to be done. And as I said before, ESR and CRP in any patient beyond the age of 50 is must. So this is the primary workup of patient with headaches. Now, coming down to the last phase, that is the management. The management of headache is divided into two. One is the management of acute headache when the patient comes with them. And second is the prophylaxis to prevent those headaches. For acute headaches, the first line of treatment obviously is NSAIDs. The second is streptans. The third is or ergot. These are the three which are available with us. These two new drugs, Dictans and G-Bands, they haven't come in India, but I'm sure they would come very soon. Neuromodulation and non-pharmacology doesn't make much difference. But you have to remember that tramadol and opioids, they are not effective in management of acute headaches. So tramadol won't work in acute headaches. Now coming down to the NSAIDs, see the dosage is off. Acetaminophen is 1000 milligrams. Aspirin is 900 milligrams. This is for acute pains. The most common preferred drug among neurophysicians is naproxen. That is around 500 milligrams. And in addition to the risk of GI and cardiac, always make it sure that you are not pumping in more and producing amyloids. Very common with the most commonest drug that produces MOH is caffeine. So please, you will never see a neurophysician writing caffeine part. You will hardly see it. Because you know we might have to take MOH. Then the most important drug is the triptans for management of acute headaches. At present we have two triptans, which are two or three triptans available with us. The Suma triptan, the Zorbi triptan, and the Indiza triptan. But still we have three, four more which are available in US. But they are all similar. Maybe except duration of action. The success is around 40 to 70 percent of cases. But somehow I, I feel these drug is underused. Even we as neurophysicians, we underuse it. But that is wrong. This is probably the best drug we have. Yeah. and we should be more liberal in using it. And now there are evidence is coming up that it is even safe in pregnancy. So for acute attacks of in pregnancy also. But there are certain points that we should know about triptans. First they should be used early. They wait and wait and wait and when the headache becomes bad and then they start taking medicines. At that time they are severely puking. They puke out the drugs and the drugs are not effective. And then they have to go for the injectables. So one of the foremost principle of management of migraine is that take the drug the moment you feel that you are going to get a common migraine. Secondly, the efficacy is around 70%. So still 30% of the people, despite of taking triptans, might continue with their headaches. And third very important stuff is that the half-life of these triptans is just two to four hours. Whereas migraine can last up to 72 hours. So if you take plain triptan, within four hours the headache is back. And then you cannot take a triptan. So that is why a combination of triptan with naproxen becomes more efficacious rather than plain triptan. Plain triptan can be useful for intranasal spray, sublingual, or even injective. That would give you immediate relief. And mind you, not to prescribe more than four. I usually restrict triptans to five a month or once a week. Going beyond ten, you are inviting MOH. So better. And before prescribing MOH, you should know the side effects. It is a strong vasoconstrictor. 
So any patient with accelerated hypertension, ischemic heart disease, angina, stroke, peripheral vascular, be careful. You might induce severe vasoconstriction. So these are certain important points that you should know when you are using triptans. Serotonin syndrome is very rare. I have not seen in my 25 years of career a patient with triptan and serotonin syndromes. Ergots, I have never used. I have seen very few prescriptions of ergot, but the problem is the same as that with triptan. They are strong vasoconstrictors. So mind you, don't prescribe ergots and triptans. Uh, don't prescribe ergots and triptan together. It can be catastrophic. Now coming down to the two new drugs which are in the pipeline. First is the Detans. The drug name is Lasperdita. These are not vasoconstrict. So the advantage of triptans is you can give more freely in ischemic heart disease and peripheral vascular disease and strokes. The problem with Detan is it can produce sedation. So preferably you have to give in the evening or the afternoon and maximum four tablets a month. So Lasmi Detan might come anytime in India. And the second is G-Pant. G-Pants are Utro G-Pant, Rooney g, -pant, Rooney g and there are many more in pipeline. g pants have an advantage of they will be probably approved for both acute management and for prophylaxis. So that will be one advantage of G-Pants. And second advantage is that they are not vasoconstrictors. So they will definitely have an edge over triptans in some of the cases. So let us wait for the detans and G-Pants to come in India. And third is that they are not, G-Pants are not related to cause MOH. So three advantages of G-Pants over triptans, acute plus chronic, no MOH, no vasoconstrictions. Then the neuromodulations which are not available in India, so I am not going much into detail, but they are best preferred when there is pregnancy and you don't want to give drugs. And the non-pharmacological is being dark, take rest, meditation and blah blah. Now coming down to the prophylaxis. For that you should know what is the definition of common migraine is more than 15 attacks a month and for more than 3 months. And when will you start prophylaxis? Patient in migraine to check. But do you want to start prophylaxis in all of them? Probably no. If the patient has 2 or 3 disabling attacks, the attacks are so bad enough that patient's lifestyle is just he cannot go to the job and he is a high profile man. He will need prophylaxis. Complicated migraines like hemiplegic migraines, migraines with prolonged aura. And when the migraines don't respond to acute attack treatment, these are the situations where you would not like the acute attacks to come again and again. And you will use the drugs for prophylaxis. Now, which are the drugs you will use for prophylaxis? The list is long. The anti-epileptics are there. The antidepressants are there. The beta blockers are there. And antihypertensives are there. The new drug on the block is these monoclonal antibodies. CGRP monoclonal antibodies. I'll talk a bit about them. They are available in the market. And now the last drug is the botulinum toxin. So these two are the drugs which are now the darling of pharma people. I will tell you why. But first let us go to the drugs. In anti-epileptic the most recommended drugs are valproic acid and topiramate. These two have 3 plus efficacy and most commonly prescribed. You should know the side effects of topiramate as well as one point acid if you have 
prescribing them. One percocet can come up with PCODs, weight gains, hair loss, hepatotoxicity, tremors. These are very common side effects with one percocet. And topidamide can produce behavioral changes, weight loss, renal stones, and glaucoma. These are the common side effects of topidamide. Now even there are some evidences of levetiracetam, brigabali, gabapentin, and zonisamide, but not very routinely used for the management of prophylaxis. The other drugs are the beta blockers, and the most commonly prescribed drugs are propranolol and metoprolol. If you look at the established evidence. It tells you that valpercacid, topiramate, propranolol are the first drug of choice. But what I use more common is the anti-epileptic, propranolol and the antidepressants, the amitriptylines, duloxetines and venlafaxins. And we are pretty comfortable with these drugs. Candisatin I have never used. And lisinopril, mementin, I never used. But yeah, these are the drugs with which we are very happy. The most surprising part when I read this article was that flunarazine is missing in this list. There is chilla pachi sarasti. And which was there in our textbooks, but it is not there in the latest. Canadian as well as the American Society recommendations, they are slightly surprised. The, the way we go for prophylaxis, normally we start one or maximum two drugs. Give a trial of three months. If the patient responds to that, we continue it for three to six months more before tapering it. And if the patient doesn't respond to the first line of drug, then we go to the second line. The problem is after three to six months of tapering of these drugs, it is very common the patient gets a chance to be double easy. Kya should be saru hot? Ane pachi matha na dukha ho fariya. The problem is that one has to tell them that this will stay. It will not go permanently. The natural history of migraine is that it starts at the age of menarch, around 12-15 years. And by the time female reaches menopause, 50 to 70 percent of the females, the severity goes down, the intensity goes down, the frequency goes down, but it never gains off. So patient has to learn to live with headaches. And like I have migraine. I take twice a month tablet and that's fine. I'm living with it. There's a very bad habit about a lot of doctors. They say, Tamari nas tabaj. That is one of the commonest explanations. We do say, Tamara magad ma lohi ho chufa. That is a common. Abhi aaj kal tiju ek fashionable thai ho chai. Tamara magad ma chemicals ma gar pad. These three are the most commonest explanations. It is a cover of the Prati Mahamagat ma chemicals. We tell him, no, he has migraine, he has to live with it. Why can't we talk straight? He is searching, what can we do? So I would be happy if, if, if we talk straight with them, the headaches are going to be there. Why to show achieving to them? <laughs> so let us accept that there will be two twice or twice migrate per month and we have to live with that. Now, coming down to these two drugs, you know, this is what now the American and the Canadian society recommends. If the first two drugs fails, you have to use this monoclonal antibody and botulinum toxin for prophylaxis. This is what is recommended. Now, let me first go to the monoclonal antibody. Only one is available in India. There are now five, seven. The arrow number. You give one injection. 
subcutaneous is 70 milligrams. And there is 50% reduction in the intensity and severity. And the second drug is botulinum toxin that we use 155 units monthly at multiple sites. And that also gives an efficacy of 50%. Now, Majaki Bhat here, this has an efficacy of 50, that has, a, has an efficacy of 50. So if I have, let us say, four attacks a month, probably my headaches would come down to two, maybe one. So for reducing or getting benefit of two headache days, every month I have to spend 20,000 rupees on Aranumba and 155 units of bottling and toxin would be 35,000. So spending around 60,000 a month to prevent two attacks of migraine is what is recommended by the American and the Canadian society. <laughs> because their insurance is there. So, <laughs> so, so I was a bit surprised. But if you give me that money, I will tolerate the headache. <laughs> yes, that, that is what I am saying. This, this is where the pharma comes into the play. So this is the recommendation, but frankly, uh, very few. In fact, Skaulta Haida, the other neurophysician says, I will give you a random map, he comes to me, the patient comes to me. Then the headache may not come. So, so, but these are the recommendations given by the headache society. So, the side effects are around, constipation is the main side effect of Aranumab and you might have to give two or three doses before the effect of headache comes. And it is not recommended in children, elderly, pregnancy and breastfeeding people. And the lifestyle modifications, I doubt many of the people would do it. But yeah, yoga, meditation and acupuncture are very good, good efficacy. In, yeah, then there is a confusion. If, if you do a lot of fasting, it precipitates migraine. So, so one has to go to the individualized uh, intermittent fasting might help you in that. And you have to curb caffeine and alcohol for that. There are certain trials of magnesium and riboflavin which can help in prophylaxis of medicine. I think so. I've done enough for acute and prophylaxis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions if you want. Sir, what is the management of MOH? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, it was an expected question. It's a fair question. First is to remove the offending drug. That is as simple as this. And start using drugs like Valbric acid. Again, another surprising factor what I had seen here and what we read before. What we were taught was that you give short term steroids. Suppose if the headache is severe, admit the patient, give methylprednisone for <coughs> 2 days, 15, 2 days, 20, 2 days, 10, out. Along with that, I would start valproic acid and cyclic or something of that sort. So, what would be your choice of medicine in pediatrics? Sir? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Pediatric, again, the, the, there is not much difference. Valproic acid is very safe, and on this side, cyclic is safe, and amitriptyline is fine. Duloxetine is fine. Okay. And propranolol. Topiramide I don't use. I don't use. What do people use? Topiramide. You can use. There is no contraindication there. But you have to make it sure. First, which is an unknown, probably most of the doctors don't know, is that it can produce glaucoma. Mm. So, yes. tell, so tell the patient if you have vision defect, come in here. One of the neurophysicians in Bombay was sued by a patient because he did not inform that I can talk about. Second, stones, renal stones. Third, if you are giving with valproic acid, the combination of valproic acid and tropiramate can produce hyperammonemia syndrome. So patient can become unconscious. And last is the behavior problem. A patient can develop a lot of behavioral issues in tropiramate. It is a good drug. 
provided you take into consideration all the side effects you inform the patient that there is a problem with the bike. But there is no problem with the bike. Sir, I would like to know the dosage of the prophylaxis you are Describing like propranolol or enlafaxin or even propranolol. Fine. How will you increase the dose? Simplest is the propranolol, 10 milligram twice a day, shall we go? And then you can go up to 40 pd, 80 pd. The maximum dose is 320 milligrams. You have to look for radical. Many times the sexual drive goes down. The body aches. You have to be careful about these subjects. Venlafaxin, you start with 25, 50, 75, you can go up to 200. The side effects is constipation and anticholinergic side effects. So many times people can have sexual dysfunction, there is no ejaculation. Be careful about glaucoma, constipation, dryness of mouth. Duloxetine, brother of venlafaxine, similar side effects. Maximum dose is 120. We start with 20 milligrams. And topiramid, start with 25. Max dose is 200. What is your strategy about paroxysmal hemicremia and hemicremia continuum? How long do you continue with endometrial? First thing you should know is the diagnosis of paroxysmal. And second thing you should know is endomethacin responsive headaches. These are endomethacin responsive headaches. Meji koi dawa kaam nahi kare How long you will do? You will have to continue for long, on and on and on. The moment you stop, the headache will be back. So B, if it is a strictly unilateral, short acting headache with TAC, for maybe few seconds to minutes, prefer endomethacin not naproxen and these are endometers in responsive headaches. So do you understand the question? I am using it till yesterday I was using it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, I will have to go back to the textbooks, the latest textbooks, why they have stopped recommending it. Well, this, this is from the latest continuum, uh, this whatever I have borrowed is from the latest continuum last year and their filmerizing was missing in the American as well as the Canadian Scenic Society recommendation. So I will have to go into that. Why they have dropped side failure? The only side effect that we have encountered is weight gain. And if the patient is elderly, it can precipitate Parkinson's, which is reversed. Otherwise, no great side effect. Is. So where does it fit in your uh, scheme of things? It is one of my first hand drugs. Okay. You see, you have to be careful. Female, I would have yeah, yeah. Obese, I would have worried. If I want to use Cybelium, then I would combine Cybelium with Topiramid. Okay. There is weight loss with Topiramid and Cybelium can produce weight gain. Both will counteract each other. Both logos. Both logos. So they will counter each other's side effects and will have a good benefit in that. You see, uh, frankly, the management is a play. You have a patient, let us say she is a young female. At the same time, secondary anxiety or depression is there. I would prefer emitted play if she is not sleeping well. And if she is sleeping well, I would prefer to look at her well of less. It is a play of young female, headache with depression. One is sleeping well, second is not sleeping. A female, young, constipation, I would not use any of these things. What I have found is that if you give benefit of 10% to the patient with zero side effect, he will give you another chance. But if you give a benefit of 20% with two side effects, he will not come back. So it is very important to you know play between the side effects and the benefits. And it is a frankly a play. Which drug to use when? A constipation on the amitriptyline now, for she is sleeping well, she will sleep and she will be constipated. Nothing will happen. Then you switch over. Yeah, this is the way that the patient is not going to happen. You don't know, you further exacerbated the constipation. She had menstrual problem and you added valproic acid. You have further accentuated a PCO. You have further increased. Large number of females won't come because of weight gain. 
So one, one has to look into those small, small things and manipulate which drug to use when. Sir, how do you manage cancer headache? Superficial temporal arthritis, and what is the managing? When do you? Sir, the main symptoms here, we should suspect that temporal arthritis. In condition. First, as I said, any new headache beyond the age of 50. <coughs> Second, this patient would have polymyalgia rheumatica. The patient would have body aches along with that. Third, the ESR and CR. Fourth, clinically you can try to feel thickened. You can see many times if there is baldness. And you can see a thickened superficial temporal artery on the forearm. So these are the points. And fourth is the steroids, management is steroids. If you don't use steroids, as I said, the patient is likely to go blind in one of the arteries because of giant cell arthritis. The steroids are to be given starting with full dose 1 milligram per kilogram. And then you taper the dose depending upon the ESR and CR. Don't be in a hurry to taper. Go slow. Monitor ESR and CR and then only taper. Chances of recurrence are? Yes, there. Very high. Sir, so what do you prefer in stress or tension here? Tension addicts. There are so many of them. As I said, it is a play. <laughs> if sedation is a problem, so any drug which is TCA, tricyclic antidepressant, then we treat whatever. If a patient is getting good sleep, I would prefer SNRIs. SNRIs are the well of lexins and the If patient is constipated, I even use SSRIs. SSRIs are the sertaline, the fluoxetines, the acetalograms. You can use the combination that is metazepine, but I don't know how much comfortable are you with these kind of drugs. I would say that you should use that drug where you are comfortable. If you don't know the side effects, you, you might, you know, not make a word, you will be confused. So, learn one or two groups of medications, understand the side effects and use them. Obviously, we know all these drugs, so we know that play, whether to use SRI, SSRI or SNRI or TCAs or the other drugs. But these are the drugs commonly used. Sir, this profile is happy with she used this type of profile exercise if patient falls into the of starting profile exercise? Yes, I have. How much do you think? I say we usually give for six months. I mean, patient has some day. So, why I am giving you this? Prophylaxis is to the break the cycle of repeated attacks. One time the cycle is broken. Then in the month, one of the people who are suffering from pain is not going to be able to get out of the pain. The worst thing, the worst mistake they do is that wait, mati jashin, mati jashin. And they mess up. This is clear explanation. Even during aura. Sir, what is the cause of pain? Thank you. So after an enlightening talk by Dr. Bhatia, we go again to another talk which is more of like medical management. Thank you. So without much ado, let's start with this. And uh, acute vertigo is the topic and its treatment. So we first would like to understand the patient expectations and challenges faced the differentiate between central and peripheral vertigo. I think all of these topics have been covered yesterday as well. Yes. So more of it would be a reputation. Yes. And so I would like to be a little brief. Right. So we take some, suppose a case where the patient comes, a 36 year old female patient comes, complains of vertigo spells four to eight times in the last three days. She felt like the room was spinning and it lasted for a few seconds. She experienced vertigo mostly when she changed positions, which in fact, we are be talking about the VBPV if it is there. The vertigo spells seemed to resolve on its own after several seconds. And on examination, no associated neurological symptoms. Patient denied hearing loss, autalgia, autoria, oral fullness, or tinnitus. She also denied noise exposure, ear trauma, prior ear surgery, or family history of hearing loss. 
So, this is actually a sudden onset of a vertigo attack. So, we need to know the duration of attack which would vary based on the etiology. Loss of balance, difficult to walk or stand, may be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, anxiety. Affects daily routine, symptoms last for few days to few weeks. So, this type of patients walk in our OPD very often and we need to know how to evaluate and manage practically these cases of acute vertigo. So, what are the challenges in the diagnosis and management? First is understanding patient's description of vertigo. Patient keeps on describing in such a way as if you will go into a vertigo. You never understand what he is trying to tell. So, these are the situations which happens quite often. So, patients often have difficulty in describing their symptoms with conflicting accounts being given at different times. And then that leads to some misdiagnosis. Up to 80% of the patients are misdiagnosed and only 20% may receive a correct vertigo diagnosis. It could be depression or anything, some tension or some different things would precipitate like this. So, patient related factors, they are the difficulty in adhering to treatment. Anxiety may significantly increase the risk of recurrences and we need to meet the patient's expectations, expect returning to active lifestyle at the earliest. And one thing I just want to tell that all in the earlier lecture where Dr. Bhatia talked about so many drugs and all and there are so many questions from our audience, I would prefer to refer it to a neurophysician rather than indulging into it because it becomes so difficult to understand the side effects, effects of multiple drugs which are used in vertigo and at least the headache. So, causes of vertigo could be are broadly classified as peripheral <coughs> or the central. It could be BPPV, acute vestibular neuritis, acute labyrinthitis, menial disease, herpes zoster, oticus, cholesterol, autosclerosis, paralympatic fistula. We know these all things are there, then we can manage it very well. Central causes could be migraines, cerebrovascular disease, multiple sclerosis, cerebral multi-angle tumors. The timing of symptoms of vertigo is very important. And we, if you go into this chart, you will see that if a patient is having BPPV, the duration of episodes is into seconds. Associated auditory symptoms are not there and it is a peripheral lesion. If it is a paralympatic fistula, again it could be in seconds. Associated auditory symptoms, yes, and again it is peripheral. If it is a TIA, it could be in seconds or hours and there are no associated auditory symptoms and it is a central reason. If it is Meniere's disease, hours together it happens and associated symptoms, yes, they are there. We know the triad of the Meniere's and it is a peripheral. If it is a vertiginous migraine, again for hours it happens, no associated auditory symptoms and it is a central reason. If it is labyrinthitis, it can be for days and yes, there will be auditory symptoms and it is again a peripheral. If it is a stroke, it would be for days, no auditory symptoms and it is a central reason. If it is a vestibular neuronitis, it is again for days, no auditory symptoms and a peripheral reason. If it is acoustic neuroma, it will be for months together. Auditory symptoms yes. for acoustic neuroma, yes, and we know that it is a peripheral. Now, at this point, I would like to tell that acoustic neuroma in the last year, say more than 6 months, we have detected more than 12 patients of acoustic neuroma just by doing an MRI. Patient comes, unilateral tinnitus or vertigo, not responding to treatment, get an MRI done because that will only pick up a small lesion. We have picked up unilateral lesions, we have picked up bilateral lesions which could be very well treated with a stereotactic radio surgery less than 2 centimeters. So, initial high index of suspicion we need to have. If everything is normal, then you have to think into that matter. Get a hearing test done, get a barrier done or an MRI done and pick up the acoustic neuroma as early as possible. Then the cerebral tumors, it would last for months. Auditory associated symptoms would not be there, it's a central. Multiple sclerosis again months, no auditory symptoms and it's a central reason. So, when we are diagnosing, in the, uh, diagnosing a patient in the OPD, it is very important to keep all this thing into mind. <coughs> For whatever as I was taught earlier in my college days that history taking is the key. 
So you have to be very patient with the patient and take the history properly. We used to run our Vertigo clinic uh, in BJ Medical College and uh, abroad in Brunei with, uh, you know, many of you know, Dr. Nayan Parekh. So he runs a Vertigo clinic in Brunei. And uh, every week, like, uh, he would give appointment and take only five patients. And that would take the whole day, you know. So you have to be very patient in taking the history. So history taking is very important and asking the right question. You have to write, you, the patient may mislead you, can direct you into a different direction, but you need to bring him back to the point and ask the right question. Question on the onset, time, course, length of the attacks. Does head motion inside or elevate the vertigo? Is there hearing loss, tinnitus or a sensation of oral fullness? Are there is exaggerated when the vertigo is worse? Any previous head injury, pressure changes or symptoms of a viral syndrome? Is it associated with headache? Is there any neurological symptoms? Is there any history of drug? Is there history of psychiatric illness? Many of the patients would come with files and taking antipsychotic drugs and they would be having something else. This is quite common in practice. And uh, if you again take the another chart, there are clinical features of peripheral versus central vertigo. So, if the, look at the direction of nystagmus. If it is central, it can be vertical or other direction and many and may change direction with change in gaze. Many of this I understand is a reputation, but just bear with me, we will just classify and go ahead. In a peripheral vertigo, it could be horizontal or torsional, never, in a, never vertical, same direction in all gaze. Fatigability, central, not fatigable, peripheral, fatigable. Onset, central, subacute or slow, peripheral, acute. Visual fixation, not suppressed. In peripheral vertigo, it is suppressed. Nausea, vomiting varies and in peripheral, it may be severe. Autologic symptoms in central rare, in peripheral, common. Neurological symptoms common in central, rare in peripheral. Instability is severe, unable to stand in central and mild to moderate in peripheral. Duration, it can in central it keep on persisting and for <coughs> peripheral it could be a short duration. So, orienting the examination, we, we need to do some positional maneuvers even in the OPD. Positional maneuvers for central causes could be a rhombox test, a tandem walking test or a vestibular ocular reflex test, that is the Dow's eye movement. This can be done in the OPD. So, rhombus text, we know, we don't go into the detail how it's done. And uh, then, how do, uh, when do you say the test is quality? When there is significant imbalance, when eyes are closed, imbalance worsens on closing the eyes. Interpretation, positive with eyes open, means the vestibular progressivity or cerebral deficit may lead to increasing in the sway. Poor imbalance with the eye open, it could be a cerebral ataxia. Swaying increases with eyes closed and no swaying with eyes open, then vestibular or proprioceptive systems involved. Then do a tandem walking and again in the tandem walking test, <coughs> normal gait, smooth continuous rhythm, abnormal gait, patients with acute or chronic vestibular dysfunction fail to accomplish even 10 steps. Cerebral, intracranial, brain lesions, patient deviates to the affected site. Right. And then again you have this thing, diagnose, send it to the neurologist who will take the further plan of action. Then vestibular ocular reflex, the Down's eye movement interpretation. Mm -hmm. Normal oculocephalic reflex, when the conjugate eye movement to the opposite side and spontaneously returns to the midline. Intact brainstem. And in an abnormal oculocephalic reflex, incomplete or absence of horizontal eye movement, impairment of the brainstem. Here, uh, Dr. Srinivas' role comes uh, in very handy. He has all the devices made and has made our life very easy. Right? So, the device tells you what, what is the interpretation, vestibular ocular reflex and all those things. If there is a partially abnormal oculocephalic reflex, the conjugate eye movement opposite to the head turning but uh, does not return to midline and brainstem is intact but cerebrum uh, function is not intact. So, these are the red flags that tell you that you have to take opinion of a neurologist. <coughs> right. If there is a cranial nerve palsy, there is pacular edema, ectopia, severe headache, non-peripheral vertigo, dysarthria, persistent worsening of vertigo or disequilibrium ataxia or other cerebral signs. Positional maneuvers, 
would be a Dix sulfide test or Appleys maneuver or other maneuvers. So, need for management is because of the risk of morbidity, impairment of quality of life, chronic vertigo, economic burden. And inadequate management or incomplete treatment of active vertigo may result in chronicity of the disease and sense of impairment uh, apart from significant economic burden. So, what are the things that we use? So, the vegetable suppressant for treatment of acute vertigo, it could be vegetable suppressant like the propylorazine, cinerazine or cinerazine din dimenhydrate. In normal vestibular pathway maintaining balance of the body, normally both ears send equal signals to the brain stem during head still position. Vestibular nuclei interpret and analyze the inputs regarding the subject's special orientation from the afferents received from the inner ear. The firing activity of the vestibular nuclei is influenced by the inputs received by it. In case of head movements to one side, input from same side, ear increases and opposite side ear decreases. So, brainstem after receiving the signals from the periphery, interprets this equal activity as no motion when the balance is maintained. Hyperactive vestibule leads to false signals resulting in vertigo. When there is derangement of normal input, uh, normal input as occurs in peripheral vestibular region, firing activity of the vestibular nuclei increases and it increases the generation of false impulse at vestibular level. Then the brainstem interprets the false impulses received from the deranged vestibule and there is an excess firing of the vestibular nuclei which leads to vertigo. Modulation of vestibular function is the basis of the most anti-vertigo treatments. So, modulation of the vestibular function. The therapeutic benefit relies more on a general reduction of hyperactivity at vestibule and brainstem and suppressing the vestibule results in decreased generation of false impulses which results in the control of symptoms of vertigo. So there is a need to suppress the vestibule in acute vertigo with vestibular suppression. Hyperexcitability of events, acute vertigo, if you decrease the hyperexcitability, there is no vertigo. So, vestibular suppressants in acute vertigo, we desire for a relief of acute vertigo attacks and among suppressants, propylopyrazine is considered as the most preferred medication for acute vertigo. Propylopyrazine in comprehensive vertigo management, propylopyrazine onset of action is 30 minutes, vertigo recurrence is 23.6 percent, nausea vomiting control is there and there is an anxiety control as well. Synergin, it takes 4 hours. Vertigo recurrence is 42 percent, nausea vomiting control is not there and anxiety control is also not there. Synergin plus diamond hydronate, it is not known and yes there is control of nausea vomiting but other things are not known. So among the available agents, prochlorperazine offers the fast recovery, lesser recurrence and also acts on associated symptoms. Prochlorperazine is recommended globally for management of acute vertigo, even the American guidelines, Indian guidelines, UK guidelines, Italian guidelines or Australian guidelines or the ENT UK guidelines. So what is the role of prochlorperazine in acute vertigo? The dopamine receptor, it is a D2 receptor antagonist, centrally acting via blockade of CTZ, mild vestibular sedation via H1 blockade, 5 mg TDS for 5 to 7 days for acute vertigo, peripheral and central etiology. So these are the uh, details of what, how the prochlorperazine is compared to the beta histidine and synergy in acute vertigo. Don't go into that. The uh, prochlorperazine is a better supplement is used uh, in peripheral and central vertigo. It is a better, uh, it gives a better suppression of the peripheral and central vertigo. So again, there is a comparison with beta histidine, synergy, and others. It is uh, the only thing is that it is effective, safe, and is associated with lesser recurrence. Vestibular compensation takes from 7 days to few weeks. So vision, vestibular <coughs> information and proper assumptions. So recovery process by brain is called as vestibular compensation. Brain copes with the disorienting signals coming from the inner ear and by learning to rely more on alternating signals coming from ear, ankle, legs, neck. This takes from 7 days to few weeks. So, prochlorperazine 3 times a day, 5 mg, 7 days is the dose. Safety profile, we know that 
uh, studies done in 1428 Indian patients and 500 Indian patients shows that total level is well tolerant. These are the different papers we can quote. Now, it is one of the preferred drugs for acute management even in BPPV, my, uh, migraine associated vertigo, vestibular neuronitis, level 30s, or immunity disease in acute. And then you can diagnose and do the larger management and long term management. <coughs> So why do you prefer clopidogrel? It has a faster onset of action, offers excellent anti-vertigo effects. For symptomatic relief of uh, acute vertigo, it is one of the best choices. Associated with less recurrence, better suppression of the peripheral and central vertigo, and is well tolerated. So, for acute vertigo, we know the key takeaways that history taking must be accomplished by asking the right question. Management of acute vertigo warrants the use of drugs that facilitates faster onset of action with lower incidence of recurrence. Use vestibular suppressants in acute phase of vertigo. Proglobulazin has excellent anti-vertigo effects and is the best drug for symptomatic relief in acute phase of vertigo. It offers better suppression of vertigo of uh, peripheral and central origin, has less recurrence than other agents and controls not only vertigo but also vertigo associated symptoms like nausea, vomiting, anxiety and headache is a well tolerated drug, less sedation compared to senazine and it takes up to 7 days or few weeks for completion 5 mg TDS is the dose right thank you very much a lot of things about the drugs the master is here this is like showing a light to the sun here about the medical management of acute vertigo but anyway, a lot of things would be, have been uh, overlapped. Okay. Thank you very much. No, madam. This, that is one paper which I quoted. Okay. Yeah. So many of many people have studied, and uh, many of them have are the neurologists who have studied this. The neurophysicians, some ENTs, among the ENTs, Bowen is one of them. Thank you. diagnosis is very much important before starting the drug therapy and as in surgery we must know that which patient we should not operate same in the drug therapy we must know what not to give what to give is also important but what not to give we must not worsen the patient condition okay so what is the ideal drug so it must give the symptomatic relief must remove or reverse the pathology of the vertigo. It can be used for the prevention or the recurrence and it must not depress the or delay the vestibular compenses. Objective, that is one saying, it must provide symptomatic relief and must not worsen also the coexisting disease and act by either stimulation or the depression of the relevant neurotransmitter. As we know, there is no common treatment for all the patients in one type of. There is totally a therapeutic approach to diagnose the patient and to treat the patient. These are the common etiology involved. And this is the this is what prevalence in the neuroautological clinic, what we see in our clinics. And what I have highlighted with red are the patients which require the pharmacotherapy. The vegetable migraine Pantiasar is very well covered, so no need to repeat, I think. This is the spontaneous episodic vertigo patient and 11% of the cases in the disease clinic are of vegetable migraine cases. This is one uh, case of the lady that I have come across last week. Presented with typically with the history of posterior canal BPP, diagnosis as posterior canal big salpic was positive, delivery the airplane manual. After three days after the relief, started complaining about the bifrontal headache, photophobia, phonophobia. So it is a what to correlate? Is the BPP is responsible for the migraine or CS already migraine was there? <laughs> And that predisposed to the BPP. So this type of patient also we come across. So what is the line of therapy in the vegetable migraine? Right from the lifestyle modification is the first.
prophylaxis, accurate tech, treat the comorbid and the physical therapy. And as Bhatia Sarah says, you have to live with that. That means the too much remedies are suggested. That means the disease can be cured, you can do also only to prevent. So these are the lifestyle modification what we can do. These are the trigger factor, evidence of the trigger is the mainstay of the treatment. Evidence to bright light, sunlight, loud sound, strong and smell, strong smell, change in the sleep patterns. Points to be remembered before in the prophylaxis. Patient who have chronic daily symptom or medication overuse headache will not respond to prophylaxis. So before initiation of the prophylaxis treatment, we need to detoxify. That means we have to stop the offending factor and start with low dose and gradually increase the dose. At least take for 4 to 6 weeks to attain the efficacy and continue at least for the 3 months. So beta blockers already talked by Dr. Bhatia sir in the morning. This is the dose and we must know that it should be Ever in the asthma patient, heart disease patient, young patient because it can cause the importance. Anticonvulsant, well provided, has been talked by Dr. Bhatia sir, so no need to repeat. It is very preferred in the prolonged severe migraine cases and in the non obese case patient. Topiramate is very effective. It should be preferred in the obese patient with the prolonged migraine and the medication overuse patient. Avoid in the kidney stone depression and the glaucoma cases. Antidepressant, amitriptyline is the drug of choice. Dose is 50 mg to 75 mg HS. It is preferred in the patient with disturbed sleep, depression, and tension type headache. Avoid in the heart disease, children. Calcium thinner blocker, clonarizin is the first line therapy in the prophylactic in my practice. Dose is 5 to 10 mg daily. At night, it prefers in the also prefers in the severe vertigo and avoid in the Parkinson's disease, depression, and heart disease. Only side effect is weight gain. As Dr. Srinivasan has said, the magnesium is the now it is giving in the first line therapy in the prophylactic treatment of the vertebral migraine cases. It has been shown that the deficiency of magnesium leads to the increase in the chronic spreading depression. Ultrasound in the neurotransmitter release and the hyperagglutinin of the blood. So nowadays, magnesium is the first line therapy in the prophylactic. Also, vitamin D1, B6, B12 is also effective. Monoclonal antibodies is the future of medicine nowadays in the vestibular migraine. It is not easily available in India, but uh, available abroad and in the Gulf countries and people are practicing regularly. It is the long acting, less frequent doses that require once a month, highly specific and provide the more effective blockage and eliminated by the proteolytic degradation. So do not involve the liver. So no hepatotoxicity. Acute attack management of vestibular migraine headache already explained. So no need to repeat it. Triptans already discussed by sir. <coughs> Feature is neuromodulation techniques and the monoclonal antibodies. The special mention of SSRI, combination of pyracetam, minoceptin and zinc biloba is effective in the geriatric age group. And prescription in the whole age group will include the dietary changes, lifestyle modification, yoga meditation, and the vestibular rehabilitation is very useful. Come to the many diseases. Many of this is require the accurate diagnosis, patient education and the step by treatment. Treatment of vertigo, deafness and the tinnitus. So this is a very interesting case I come across. This is a case of female 30 year. There is typical history of many years. Ear fullness, vertigo, vomiting followed by relief of the attack after vomiting. So even only working 24 milligram TTS for 6 months, totally relieved. No complaint for a year. Then after come back with the vertigo and recurrent fall, sudden falls. No result with vertin and the diamox. No result with the intertympanic gentamicin. So that after on VNG hyperventilation test is positive. So treated as vestibular peroxysmia. Relieved with carbamazepine called vertigo. Low dose continue for six months. 
After that, she developed skin lesion all over the body. Diagnosis lichen planus on steroids since one year. She was anti allergic. No, no anti vertigo is there, no, no carbamazan, and there is no vertigo. So, what to do? <laughs> Whether patient having many years, vestibular paroxysmia, or it is an autoimmune, autoimmune component of the inner ear. So, this type of patient we also come across. So, treatment of the mania is the treatment of the acute attack and the prophylactic therapy, anti vertigo and the anti emetics and the steroids in the acute attack are very effective. Prophylactic beta is the drug of choice, it is the dual action, weak H1 agonist and the H3 antagonist. Doses is the 24 to 48 milligram weight only. Microstoop also recommended in 7 20 milligram per day. But in my practice, I have never gone above 24 milligram TDS. Higher dose of greater efficacy is shown in the study. It was effect of GI upset, headache, skin disease. So it is contrary indicated in the peptic ulcer, pregnancy, and bronchial asthma patient. Role of diuretic are there, carbonic and anhydrous inhibitors act by reducing the inner ear fluid pressure and thereby reducing the amount of fluid in the inner ear. Acetazolamide up to 250 milligram BID can be given is very effective in the many other disease. The diuretics are believed to be decrease the endolipidic pressure and volume by decreasing the overall fluid volume and the fluid balance in the inner ear. They are shown to induce the short term hearing improvement in the many other disease. Definitive beneficial effect on vertigo, but no long term effect on the hearing. The trans symphonic gentamentin is another remedy we use in many other patients who does not, does not respond to the oral medication. So, it is given trans symphonic injection, 1 to 2 ml of gentamentin in the concentration of 20 to 40 mg per ml, given at the interval of 4 weeks. A patient whose position is keeping head up, ask patient not to swallow or cough after injection for 15 minutes. Effect is confirmed by the worsening of the vertigo for few days, then relieved. If vertigo prolonged, then one would consider the vestibular reevaluation therapy. Nowadays, it is given at the interval of 4 weeks, 3 injections are given. This regimen is associated with the less than 10% significant gaining loss. It is the treatment of choice in the vestibular drop attack or the Tumantin crisis. Keeping in mind the possible autoimmune etiology of the many other disease, the trans steroids are also used, but it is less effective than gentamicin. The treatment of Tumantin autoimmune crisis is intertepenic gentamicin or sometimes very high dose of beta estin is also required. <coughs> Treatment of deafness and tinnitus, it is digital hearing aid and tinnitus retraining therapy. So on the first victory, we should explain every patient that this is the chronic disease and progressive disease and treatment start from acute attack to the prophylactic. On the first victory, we should explain everything about the treatment, right from the oral therapy, hearing aid, vestibular rehabilitation and the surgery in cases of the resistance cases that patient does not provide hurting or attacks suddenly come back after the stopping of the medical therapy. So, vestibular neurectomy is the treatment of choice in that cases. So, home remedies, we should patient, uh, educate patient about that home remedy. Please sit down and lie down when you feel dizzy. Try to focus on objects that are not moving. Rest during and after attack. Don't trust for the normal activities. Be aware that you might lose your balance. So, avoid head injury and fractures. Lifestyle modification like limit salt, caffeine, alcohol, and so on. So, another is the vestibular neuritis. The antiviral load is questionable. I really don't use in my practice. Uh, steroids are very effective within the five days of the onset of the vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis. Supporting medicine are vestibular suppression and TMATIC. And vestibular suppression should be discontinued as soon as possible maximum 3 to 5 days because they delays the vestibular compensation and starts vestibular rehabilitation therapy <coughs> as early as possible. Methylprednisone has the very good effect in the initial phase. It attenuates work by 
18 years the capillary permeability, local exhibits and cellular infiltration and long term effect on switching of the immunodamaging process to so prevent the inner ear damage and uh, prevent the hearing loss also. So there is the prescription of the vestibular arthritis and labyrinthitis patients, steroid, antihistamine, phenothiazine and the benzodiazepine as an antiquity. Covid postural vertigo is another entity that we come across. Treatment requires the antipsychotic and antidepressant, psychological counseling, vestibular regulation therapy, behavioral therapy, and neutrophils and zinfobiloba is effective. Vestibular peroxenema, the role of carbamazepine is definitely very good. 100 mg TID up to can be given. Gabapentin 100 to 1200 mg. Pregabalin 50 mg to 300 mg per day can be given. Leposamide is the new drug. I have never used, but I have mentioned. In vestibular peroxima, as in trigeminal neurology, we found often in vessel on MRI. But in vestibular peroxima, we uh, never, most of them, we never find the vessel. So we are giving the trial of carbamazepine, it is very effective. <coughs> Motion sickness is another entity. We come across in our clinical practice and the meclizine is the drug of choice. 12.5 to 50 mg one hour prior to the travel is very effective and can be repeated after 8 hours. It is the first line of choice in vertigo in USA. It is the only large, large taking drug, drug of choice in pregnancy because it has less anticholinergic activity and less side effect. Also effective in C sickness doses can be up to 25 to 100 mg per day. That is another entity called persistent postural perceptual dizziness. That is free three, three. This is the separate entity, should not be labeled as psychogenic vertigo. It is a condition which causes the non spinning dizziness and the unsteadiness provoked by the environmental or the social factor. And for some individual, P3 can be the consequence of the acute bout of dizziness untreated. So, treatment of choice is amitriptyline, velnafexin, desvelnafexin and cognitive and the behavioral therapy. Next is the vestibular basilar insufficiency patient are also we come across in our practice. So, cinarizine plus diamond hydrogen combination is very effective. Cinarizine 8 by its calcium channel blocking, good palliative effect, gives symptomatic relief. It also reduces the RBC viscosity by enhancing the flexibility and safe drugs. Diamond hydrogen exerts the regulatory effect on the vestibular nuclei and the vegetative center in the brain stem. And of course, vestibular rebellion therapy is the also gives very good result. So these are the safe drugs in pregnancy and lactation. We should must uh, we must know that what should not be given in the pregnancy and lactation. So these are the safe and the unsafe drug indication and contraindication of the drugs in the pregnancy and lactation. We must consider this class. Imidrifilin is very effective. Nephroxin is an analgesic. So take home message is only drug dose can make a remedy poisonous. Never give many drugs. Sometimes we see prescription like stematil 1 TDS, 201 1 TDS, Vertin 1 TDS. So it will only worsen the condition of the patient or realize the vestibular compensation and patient feel dizzy because of the drugs. Any incollected prescribed drug can also make a remedy poisonous. So the judicious use of the medicine and the proper combination remain the key in the vertigo. As Dr. Bharti Asar has made a is the play. You must know what combination given in the which doses in which patient, whether it is pediatric, pediatric, pregnant. So it's the keystone of the pharmacotherapy. What type of cases? So thank you, North Gujarat team, Maturi AT Hospital, Cyclops, Dr. Srinivas Train and my colleagues, Dr. Ites, for bringing me in the field of what type of. Thank you all. Thank you.
and we are continuing to do so. Not to forget the efforts which are put in by the team, uh, Rajan, the seniors, the uh, office bearers of the North Gujarat uh, Community Association, and uh, uh, all the speakers who enlightened us since yesterday. So, my dear friends, seniors, colleagues, um, my talk today is on benign paroxysmal position vertigo. Well, I'm really thankful to Mahesh Pai again for giving me this. The reason being, I like this topic personally because I don't have to tell my patients, you have to live with it. First time. Number two, I don't have to confuse myself with the use of drugs, the effects and the side effects. The patients are more than happy when they leave the vestibular clinic. The reason is, one small maneuver, perfect diagnosis, can actually change the walk, the life, the sleep of a patient. So, uh, these are the few reasons why I believe um, benign paroxysmal position vertigo is something that all of us should be very well versed with. So, let me begin by coming to the anatomy of the vestibular sense organs. I believe there are a few uh, non-ENT colleagues as well in the crowd. So, these are uh, a couple of slides uh, for them. Just for them to understand why it does BPP reoccur. So, if you look at the anatomy of the semicircle, uh, the vestibular system, our inner ear has five vestibular sense organs: the three semicircular canals, the utricle, and the sacu. Five on either side. And as we see the anatomy of the inner ear per se. So, apart from the utricle and the saccule, which are responsible for linear acceleration, detection of gravity, the semicircular canals are three in number on either side. And they are placed nearly orthogonal to each other, meaning they are placed at nearly right angle degrees to one another. And the other thing is, the semicircular canals function in pairs. So, the right lateral and the left lateral semicircular canal will form one pair. The right anterior and the left posterior will form the second pair. And the left anterior and right posterior semicircular canal will function in pairs. This is a basic concept very important for us to learn because that is what helps us identify the canal involved. They are responsible for detection of angular acceleration. They are immune to gravity. So, a semicircular canal which does not have an underlying insult in form of a autolytic particle in the semicircular canal will be immune to gravity. So whether I go up, I go down, my semicircular canal will not detect it. It will only detect angular acceptations. And every canal will have an ampullary end and a non-ampullary end. Why is it important for us to know this? This is because the ampullary end of each semicircular canal has a complete diagram. And that is where the sense organ of that semicircular canal actually sits. Therefore, if we look at the entry points into the semicircular canals, there are five entry points, the three ampullated ends and two non-ampullated ends. So, a lateral canal, non-ampullated end could be one of the entry points and the crust commune, which is the non-ampullated end of the posterior and the anterior semicircular canal coming together forms another entry point from where these autolytic particles may actually enter 
into the semicircular canals. So this is what we need to aim at while we are actually trying to treat these patients. Right? Thankfully, DPP is one of the most frequent vestibular disorders. So much so that even a general population, lifetime incidence is as high as 10 percent. The time course of BCPD is characterized by spontaneous remissions. So even if you were not to treat it, and this is what has been happening for years together, that large majority of these patients have been on medical management for BPPD and they have spontaneously regressed. Those autologic particles have spontaneously fallen off into the uterine macula and therefore the attacks of BPPD have stopped. And this spontaneous remission is as high as 50% of our patients. But although it is a very self-limiting condition, it impacts a significant discomfort in a patient's life. So what's the pathology? So we look at the sense organ of the utricle and the sacrum. So these autolytic particles are situated on the top of the uh, sense organs. <coughs> These autolytic particles are made up of calcium carbonate and all they do is they provide some weight to these organs. And it is because of this weight that the utricle and saccule can detect the clarity. Right? So, when these autolytic particles dislodge themselves from the autolytic macula, they slip off into the semicircular canals and therefore it results in inappropriate ambulum flow which deflects the cupula of the semicircular canals and modulates their activity which is produced from the rest of the lapids of the attacks, uh, affected canal and thus the attack of a positional vertigo is generated and this is what leads to the nystagmus that we elicit in a patient. We have two different kinds of pathologies that we see. If the particle is into the dome. The pathology we call it is called the canal of ichiasis. Whereas if this particle get attached to the cupula of a semicircular canal, we call it cupulolithiasis. So what, are, what do these patients present? They are typically short lasting self-limiting attacks which are aggravated with change of positions. Sometimes they may also have prolonged mild in unsteadiness, usually positional, it's usually vertigo, but after an attack, patient may feel a little dizzy, more so after the first attack. And other complaints are vegetative symptoms, nausea, sweating, tachycardia, that the patient may experience. And this is more so during the first day, so if the patient has had experienced first episode of BPPV today, the patient may be experiencing all these symptoms. But over a period of time, these symptoms tend to reduce and it all narrows down to typical positional vertigo that the patient experiences. <coughs> and not only does this patient experience uh, these the symptoms in the bed, but also in other activities like bending down, looking up, side to side movements, etc. So, with this, if you were to come to a specific diagnosis as to which semicircular canal is involved, now if the patient comes with symptoms of positional vertigo, which is short lasting, truly rotatory in nature, and it is reproducible, meaning every time patient gets into that position and he gets these episodes, we would be 
sure on the history that well this is is the this is the first differential diagnosis that i need to look into but if i were to get to this specific diagnosis what is it that i need to do so first i need to specify which semicircular canal is getting affected number one second which part of the semicircular canal is getting affected is it the canal or is it the cupula which is getting excited and which is the exact position of these autolytic particles within the semicircular canal and to reach to this diagnosis we need to do specific diagnostic position maneuvers which should essentially elicit a canal specific positional nystagmus and we should look for features like latency direction time course and duration of the position nystagmus reason being that it has to match characteristically with that specific canal involved so if i have a patient of bpd would i require further investigation if i am clinically sure that well this patient has position this type of uh, position of vertigo and nothing else so usually no but if the patient has features of a past history is of vestibular neuritis past history of meniere's past history of vestibular migraines we might need to look into it and may need some further investigations and at the same time you're dealing with the first episode of big baby you're not getting characteristic findings what you should ideally get patient is elderly patient is diabetic patient is hypertensive has history of atherosclerosis you would be more careful in diagnosing these patients with bppv more so on the first day of vertigo so what is the type of nystagmus that we would want to have in these patients as i said previously it is usually a canal specific response so if i'm stimulating a posterior semicircular canal on the left i should get a nystagmus which is appropriate for the left the posterior semicircular canal stimulation likewise for the lateral for the superior i should be able to define which side is it the right or the left right so this is one example of the nystagmus that we would see putting a dix hall pipe for this patient for the left side and the patient is made to lie down in the supine position with a 45 degree head turn and rotate it then you see that's the movement there was some latency and immediately you could see the nystagmus being generated the intensity of nystagmus was low initially it increased it has an upbeat component it has a torsional component and then after a period of time the intensity of nystagmus reduced so these are the characteristics that we would want to see and similarly on reversal of this position i should be able to see the absolute the reverse yes so these are the specific features of the nystagmus that we would want to see and this is where we would want to differentiate the nystagmus that we get from a benign paroxysmal position vertigo and a central position vertigo that we see the lot has been said about the uh, nystagmus in the uh, the other condition the central position one so it has no latency no crescendo decrescendo pattern it's purely horizontal it can also be purely vertical when it is about the main stem and it should not be time blocked with the vertigo that the patient experiences there is in bpbv all these stand true so how do we stimulate the semicircular canal in order to generate a response so 
The technique is simple. First, you need to get the head into a position wherein the what the canal which we are trying to stimulate is oriented vertically and thus we want to align that semicircular canal with gravity so that those autolytic particles move due to the effect of gravity and it is that movement which is going to produce the resistance for us. That is one. And second, the head is then rotated towards that affected canal so that we produce an appropriate response. For example, we have taken the hall pipe maneuver wherein the patient is made to sit first, the head is turned towards the right side with a little extension, uh, made to uh, lie down with a little extension and head turns towards the side which we are trying to test, the right in this case. And in the figure uh, below, you can see the movement of the particle that we would anticipate happening. And the movement that is happening inside the semicircular canal will lead to stimulation of that semicircular canal and will lead to appropriate misdiagnosis. Emphasizing the point again, direction of nystagmus is essential to the canal that is affected. Okay. Now, what is the frequency of uh, affection? Posterior semicircular canal, according to the lit international literature, is the commonest. And everyone in this audience would agree with me that posterior semicircular canal is the commonest that we see. The lateral is the second one and the least affected is the interior of the superior semicircular canal. Well, what would be the differential diagnosis to it? A central positional vertigo, maybe a vestibular migraine, which can be uh, presenting with positional vertigos, but therein we might not be able to generate a nystagmus every time we stimulate. Other structural lesions in the brainstem, tumors, degenerative disorders, fourth ventricular tumors, cysts, again can lead to such positional vertigos and especially more so, we should be careful in diagnosing these disorders when we come across pure horizontal or pure vertical forms of misdiagnosis. So can a VPP be present without a misdiagnosis? So we do so, uh, see such cases and uh, uh, one such textbook also calls them as subjective nystagmus, wherein a patient, when the moment you put that patient in that specific position, patient will have, will experience vertigo, it will be timed off, it will go away in some time, but we may not be able to generate the adequate nystagmus that we should be seeing in these patients. So what could be the possible physiology in these patients? Maybe if the autolytic particle size is too small, the kind of movement of the inner ear fluid that is expected to generate a nystagmic response may not be there. And that is the reason why we may not see nystagmus, but the patient experiences vertigo in those specific uh, situations. And another thing is, the moment you do a repositioning maneuver, you may be actually able to reposition these patients adequately, and the patient may be free of vertigo. But these are the ones which we need to call as probable benign positional vertigos rather than confirm VPTVs. So with that basic uh, uh, concept in our mind, let's understand what are the canals, what are the specific maneuvers to simulate these canals. The first one being the posterior semicircular canal and we all know the dick salt pack maneuver which is the commonest uh, maneuver that all of us to perform and I have already spoken about that wherein in the first position the patient is made to sit in the bed, the head is rotated towards the affected side 45 degrees and the, in the second step once the canal is aligned to the gravity, the second, in the second step we need to move the particles and then the, the patient is made to lie down with the head hanging from the edge of the bed and turned 45 degrees towards the affected side, wherein we would want the 
alternating particle to move from this towards the non empinated end and that, that is what would generate a classic geotropic nystagmus on the affected side. So if you diagnose that, what is the reposition maneuver that you would do? I think Srinivasa, we are going to do maneuvers separately, right? You are going to, you're going to demonstrate all the maneuvers, right? Sure, what is the plan? Sure. So, we are not, right? So, I quickly run through it. So, the, if you diagnose it as the posterior canal involved, here in, we have seen the right posterior semicircular canal which was involved, which was stimulated in which we saw the movement of the particle in there. So as in the first step again, you make the, make the patient sit, the head is turned towards the affected side 45 degrees, the patient is made to lie down with the head hanging on from the edge of the bed and the first step, we wait for the nystagmus to come. We wait for the nystagmus to have its crescendo decrescendo pattern, we wait for the nystagmus to die down. This may take up to 30 seconds. The moment this happens, we turn the head of the patient. 45 degrees to the contralateral side and we quickly roll the patient on that side and make the patient sit up again. To remind you, the position of the head should not change while this maneuver is being done. The reason is we want to push that particle out from the dome through the non ampulated end back into the utricular macula. And the moment this happens, the patient will experience vertigo and a sudden drop <laughs> of this particle into the utricular macula may at times be very violent especially if the particle size is large it may be violent so much so that a patient might experience a pulsion literally a patient may pause and you really have to hold on to the patient otherwise the patient may lose balance a small modification that Srinivasar talks about is to make the patient sit up, sorry, stand up and jump, two steps, one, two, so that that particle, it's like emptying a pepper bottle, so even if that particle is stuck up into the <coughs> non-ambulated end of the semicircular canal, literally forcing that particle to get into the utricular macula. <coughs> and with this maneuver, if this maneuver is adequately done, it has a high success rate, more than 70 to 80 percent, and once we've done this maneuver, wait for 5 to 10 minutes for the patient to settle down and if we were to repeat this maneuver with, and a successful repositioning has been done, patient may be relieved of his position okay. So that's about a place maneuver. Quick movement is very important. Quick movement. Yeah. Yes. Sir, tapping over the head will help in uh, particle no. extrusion while doing the apnea. Yes, it does. Tapping over the head uh, and something got uh, I also heard from Shiva sir is, is uh, like something like using a bone battery. Right. It may help us to dislodge the canal, especially if the particle is, is the mm -hmm. particle size is more. It's like a large conglomerate of particle which refuses to move within the semicircular canal. Uh, a bone bone vibrator may be of help for us to dislodge the particle from that canal. It is not an uh, uncommon thing that we see that we do this maneuvers where the patient does not get relief from vertigo. The moment you do it again, the patient has a similar kind of vertigo. This is one thing I have seen less often in posterior canals but more often in lateral canals. I uh, not gone into the Simons maneuver, it is just one of the other maneuvers that we do. Coming on to the next one, the lateral uh, canal BPTV, for which we also diagnose with the help of a supine roll test. Here again, the concept is similar. We make the patient sit, look for any spontaneous nystagmus, get the patient from <coughs> sitting to supine position. Here, the small change which I like to do is use a fifth, uh, small pillow that the uh, head is around 15 degrees uh, flexed, and from the supine position, we make the patient turn 
towards the affected side. Maybe the right side for the left side and C for a nystagmus which is being generated. Right, the right side first and then onto the left side and C for the nystagmus. The patient again has a, in a if, the, if it is a pure canal lithiasis, we should be able to demonstrate a down beating nystagmus in that patient. Or the, on the right side patient is a right beating nystagmus, on the left side patient is a left beating nystagmus. So the only difference being if the right semicircular canal is involved the intensity of nystagmus will be more on the right as compared to the left side. So that's how we differentiate which canal is important. Whereas if it were the opposite, if it were an apogeotropic kind of a nystagmus, a uh, vertigo or a BPPV, then the patient will have a apogeotropic kind of a nystagmus. So if the right semicircular canal is involved and the, the particle is attached to the cupula of the right side, the patient will have an apogeotropic nystagmus on the right, if I put the patient on the left, left patient has an apogeotropic nystagmus. Here the difference being that the intensity of nystagmus on the right will be less, the intensity of the nystagmus on the left will be more. So that is the small difference that we would want to see. And the treatment of choice for a canalolithiasis of the lateral semicircular canal will be with the help of a barbecue maneuver, wherein the patient is made from sitting to supine position, is turned towards the unaffected side, rolled from the unaffected, uh, uh, onto the unaffected side. So if the right was the involved side, the patient will be made to sleep, roll, uh, turn the head to the left, roll to the left, patient is made to uh, sleep prone, and then again turned from the right side, getting their head up into the right side, and then the patient is made to lie down supine, and from there the patient gets up. Another maneuver that we also do for a lateral canal BPPV, canalolithiasis of the lateral canal is the Guffoni maneuver, wherein the patient is made to sit and the patient is made to lie down on the contralateral side of the body. So if the patient is having a right lateral canal, uh, canalolithiasis, patient is made to sleep on the left, then the head is turned. Once the patient goes in that position, the head is turned up so that the particle falls into the utricular macula and then again the patient is made to sit. Whereas if the particle is attached to the cupula of the lateral semicircular canal, we need to do something which is called as the Apiani maneuver. And in the Apiani maneuver, we need to make the patient lie down onto the affected side and make the patient look down or the nose down facing the bed, get the particle to mobilize from the cupula of the lateral semicircular canal, get the particle into the dome of the lateral semicircular canal, wait for some time and then again go back and do a Guffoni maneuver and release the particle from the semicircular canal. I hope I am I'm making this concept clear. Am I? No, but you have to tell it like it is geotropic, you do like this, a geotropic. They will not know which is cupulolithiasis, which is canalolithiasis. No, sir. Lateral canals, geotropic, right lateral canal, geotropic, how to do? Right lateral canal, so, a geotropic, how geo to do? Geotropic is canalolithiasis. Yes. Epogeotropic is cupulolithiasis. Yes. If the particle is attached to the yeah, cupula. But, yeah, but yes, the question is, now that epogeotropic, is it because of cupulolithiasis or because uh, uh, the, the thing on the opposite side? So epogeotropic on one side is the geotropic of the opposite side. Yes. So the, that distinction is important uh, to have the right and left canal. You, you understand? So you, you are, once we assume that you've got a left cap, you can, so that's a point. Yeah. So coming back to that. So if I have a right lateral canal epogeotropic vertical, or a cupulolithiasis of the right lateral semicircular canal. I make the patient lie down onto the right side. The patient will have an epogeotropic nystagmus. The moment the patient goes on the left side, the patient will have an epogeotropic nystagmus on that side as well. Right? But how do I determine the side involved? The difference is that absolutely the right side will be less intense. Whereas on the left side, the intensity of vertigo and nystagmus will be more. So that's the differentiation we have between the geotropic and the apogeotropic variant. Am I clear now? 
on the table or on the bed and then the patient is asked to bend forward with the vertex touching the bed of the patient. Uh, now, the moment the patient goes, goes in that position, the particle <coughs> goes into the dome of the superior semicircular canal and the moment the particle is gets into the dome of the superior semicircular canal, the patient is made to sit up again. And the moment that happens, the particle traverses through the dome, through the um, crust commune and comes down into the utricular mantle. And the moment that happens, the patient should experience a fall uh, of the particle and a characteristic vertigo. Many a times, we can also see a pulsion. Because of the sudden drop of the particle into the utricular macula, you might see a pulsion that the patient may experience. So that is how... There is a large coat modification also. There is a small <laughs> modification. <laughs> uh, the day before, seeing uh, one patient, an uh, elderly lady with uh, knee joint issues, wherein you can't make that patient sit with, with the knees flexed. Yes. So there is a small modification we did improvisation. We made the patient actually sit on the edge of the bed, ask her to bend as forward as possibly she could, get the particle moving. And once the particle moved, we made, the, made her sit back up again, again with a little extension of the head. The moment we did that, we could actually see the particle drop into the utricular macula. The moment this happened, the moment the patient experiences some pulsion, you are sure that you have actually moved the particle. Now, what may actually happen is many a time there may be a con conglomerate of particles. Yes. Some of them have moved, there is some still there. So, once you have done, again go back and cross check whether you have given a complete cure of that semicircular canal or not. So, always cross check with another positioning maneuver to recheck that canal again. Also, check the other canals because many a time we may be having multi canal involvement, more so post head injuries. So, we may actually see multiple canal involvements. So, we should check for other canal involved as well. And if at all there is other canal which is involved, try and also reposition those canals. That is point number one. Point number two, many a times we might see, we have not seen nystagmus, but vertigo characteristic. There is no harm in repo trying a repositioning maneuver and see if the patient is getting ready. And point number three is if you are not getting after a repositioning maneuver, you are not getting relief of the position vertigo, always recheck your diagnosis, look for other causes of positional vertigo and try and rule out other causes. So, imaging is one thing you would want to see. Second thing, especially in lateral semicircular canals, they are tricky ones. Many a times we may actually spend more time than we might do a timberoplasty, you know, it, it might take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one maneuver, second maneuver and the particle just doesn't move or the particle may actually slip from the canal towards the cupula and the nystagmus pattern may change from a geotropic to an epigeotropic variant. So these are some of the challenges that we face in the lateral semicircular canal. Got to be aware of that and be persistent, be patient and try and reposition. Lateral canals are again more violent. The kind of vertigo that the patient experiences is much more violent than the patient which experiences the posterior semicircular canal vertigo. So, and it is not uncommon that while we are trying to do this maneuver, the patient might actually puke on you. So, you have got to be patient and the patient experiences a lot of vegetative symptoms. So, you actually have to give patient some time, let him settle down and then go in and do it again. So, with those uh, few um, uh, tricks that I have learned in my past few years of uh, practice of uh, uh, vertigo. We conclude by saying that when BPP is a very easily diagnosable condition. So much so that you can act, diagnose this condition on phone. You can actually treat these patients by telling them go to YouTube videos, look for tricks called by, try and do it by yourself, see what is happening, take a video recording of your eye movements and send it to me, look for this, uh, tell him go, go back to YouTube videos, Look for a play maneuver, look for cement maneuver, try and do it by yourself. If it doesn't work, then tell us. So it's that it could be that easy. Not all the time. Not all the time. Exactly. Not all the time. So even if you don't have a BNG goggle, it could be fairly easy to treat and fairly easy to diagnose. If 
significantly improves the quality of life of patients. We come across so many patients who are afraid to go to bed. They, they would just not get to that position because the feeling of that vertigo or the spinning sensation is quite violent for a lot of people. Absolutely. And you can actually revolutionize the life of a patient. Best part is it does not require any long-term medical management. So as a physician, I don't have to be scared of the side effects. And we, as physicians, we need to be aware of other causes of physician vertigo and investigate even these cases. Don't let these patients go, okay, you take this medicine for a few days and then come back again. No, be at it, do a full, full blown uh, vestibular evaluation, try and rule out other causes. And once you're extremely confident that, well, I don't have anything, but still if you're in doubt and dilemma, do a radiological evaluation, confirm you don't have any other neurological problem giving rise to this position vertigo. And once you're done with it, then you can tell your patients, well, you'll be okay in a few days time. With that, thank you all very much. Uh, sir, to demonstrate these measures. Wow. I shared the views. Ah, okay. In the group. In the group. Okay. Yes. You do VNG for all PCTV or only they are not treated by? So, so all patients, if, if the patient does not... <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Which are the patients wherein I would not do? VNG, wherein, wherein this patient has been experiencing this characteristic vertigo for a period of time. That is one. Patient is an elderly patient. Is not a young patient who is coming with PPPV symptoms. Does not have any other history which is suggestive of anything else apart from PPPV. So if I eliminate these things on history and on first, first of clinical examination, then I will subject these patients only to positional tests. Because 80 but, to 90% patients will not require VNG. Absolutely. But then, always look for spontaneous nystagmus. Even if you are not doing anything else, just put the VNG goggle on, look for the spontaneous nystagmus in these patients. Many a times, you may pick up a vestibular neurosis. It could have been a past peripheral vest, uh, 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 vestibular neuritis, which has been uncompensated. The larynx, uh, the, the uh, labyrinth has been traumatized in some way or the other. Now the patient is presented with VPP. So you can actually many a times pick up things like this. So the least that you can do for this patient is put on a VNG goggle, just look at the nystagmus pattern for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, actually before you put these patients up into this position. And one test that you I would always like to do is a head impulse test, clinical head impulse test. If I am clinical, clinical head impulse, even if I am confident of a negative clinical head impulse test, I'll be okay. We'll uh, uh, send these patients only for position uh, maneuvers, and then the patient comes back. So, uh, sir, would you want to add anything? Right? Whether you want to do a VNG for this patient or not want to do a VNG for this patient. It is more about our own, lot of patients work just itself. See, lot of us, we have started out doing our live transmission of our ear surgeries to the OPD. Some of us do, is that right? We, we want to project what we are doing. We know that we are doing a clean surgery, it looks beautiful. The person may not even understand what is happening, but then we do that, we project that to the, uh, to the world for them to see what is happening. Second thing is, the person who is waiting outside in the OPD knows the doctor is busy, so he will wait for five, six hours for you to come out of the OT because you are projecting that into the in the screen. That is uh, one. When it comes to progress of science, BPPB was there and everybody has been treating BPPB. But most books about BPPB used to be written by the Italians. And most pioneering knowledge about BPPB actually, the ideas actually started coming from Italy. And what I've been told is in, in, in Italy, Every street, there are this. There are few people who have written books whom we know, but everybody is a neurotologist. Like he is a neurotologist, he is a neurotologist. Every street is like like how we have. If you go to one particular marketplace, you go to only clocks like that. In that particular area, every person is a neurotologist like that. What happened is because of the documentation and small patterns, different different patterns that we started demonstrating, seeing like this is not like this, this is like this. The small torsional component. These are all things. How we started describing apogeotropic, geotropic, how it is altering, that the particle is really moving. All this happened because of studying the pattern. So when you go deep into this subject, it becomes a joy to just see it. Next thing is when you show to the patient, patient is telling like, 
things are going round and round. Husband does not believe. Mother-in-law does not believe at all. <laughs> now when you meet the person to go through this particular thing and the eye goes like this and then you call the entire uh, family and then okay, you can do that with a mobile camera also. If you show them that this particular thing is like this, I was going full, I saw Gumra, Gol Gol Gumra. You see, you are also feeling the entire family. That's a totally different thing. Finally, our people are somehow tuned to pay for the instrument, not for your whole night's reading of Hansen. <laughs> okay, you read the entire Hansen, you call it tomorrow, I will give you a diagnosis, you break your head and then tomorrow you will <coughs> that my charge is 1000 rupees for my reading. But if you do a instrumental, whatever it is, okay, but they will simply pay because they are for some reason and uh, for to, uh, to us, for us to help the community, to help the community, we need to be financially stable. Only then the, our thing has to be, okay. we will we, we'll be able to sustain our <coughs> ability to help. Okay. Why we need to succeed? We need to succeed to be able to do better things. Is that correct? Okay. Why we need to succeed in our practice in the initial year so that you will be able to do better things? Why do you want to have, build up a good practice? Who are the people who have bought a car store's spice cap? successful in the early part of the career. successful to be able to do better things. And when you do better things, who is going to be benefited? The community. So then that also helps us. Okay. So having an instrumentation, these things, recording, all these things helps us to better ourselves in and that eventually actually becomes better for the patient. So a lot of things are there. And I need to compliment the Dr. H. Perfect concepts. Super, okay. it's, it's a joy to see when somebody who is taking that perfect concepts from beginning to end. The way he began with semicircular immune to action of diabetes from the way he elucidated the, uh, the utricular structure, what moves from there, how it happens, all the way to the position of the body. He needs a he deserves a big hand. Why BPPV is recurrent and do we do anything to prevent recurrent osteoporosis or what? That is one more thing actually. So again, this is where we all need to put our heads uh, together and try to uh, see what is the pattern of these patients in whom the uh, recurrences are happening. Are there people, what is some things that have come up with probably people with obstructive sleep apnea tend to have higher incidence of uh, recurrences. People with migraine have higher incidence, incidence of recurrences. Recurrent PTP, as of now at least there are two conclusions that I have come across about when it comes to recurrent PTP. Recurrent BPPV in the young, they have an underlying migraine. Mm -hmm. Recurrent BPPV in the middle-aged, they have an underlying atherosclerotic vascular disease. These two things, at least I can, with whatever patterns that I have been studying, I can tell them. That because what is happening in BPPV, why in the first place the debris should move away from the uterus. Right? That particular calcium carbonate crystal belongs to the uterus. It is supposed to stay there. It has got loosened from there, means for some reason the uterus has got damaged, for some reason. One of the reasons for which the utricle gets damaged is the nerve gets damaged, like the superior vestibular neuritis. When superior vestibular neuritis happens, the nerve is damaged. And wherever a particular nerve, in the skin, cutaneous nerve you cut, you know that particular area skin starts undergoing a change. Okay, wherever there is. If you do a motor nerve is cut, the muscle undergoes atrophy. Just like that, if you remove the uh, skin superior, the utricle also starts degenerating. And so that is one reason why so commonly you see post-vestibular neuritis BPP. <coughs> and presence of post vestibular neuritis BPPV untreated is also the reason for people not compensating from vestibular neuritis because this is not allowing the compensation to happen, which you presented yesterday. When if a person's vestibular deficit is dynamically changing, there is no way to compensate. So there is something that is stopping him from compensating and becoming better. The next reason why is probably <coughs> migrainous vasospasms is something that is causing this utricular debris to be shed. The next thing is Maybe it is, there is an atherosclerotic, underlying atherosclerotic vascular disease which is causing a vascular insufficiency there, which is lead, leading the utricle to shed its uh, particles. Then there are other uh, reasons like a person who has been hospitalized, okay, there are acid base changes, these kind of things, okay. Acidosis itself is one condition where it is said to. There is one study which talks about marathon runners who, say, who tend to have. Uh, BPPV episodes after a prolonged uh, uh, 
uh, running because there is some amount of tissue acidosis. Because calcium carbonate is soluble in acidic medium and there is a layer that forms, I mean there is a cleavage plane that forms which makes it to. These are all conjectures but then when it's, you see it, you can, when it comes to the skeletal system of the human uh, being, most of our bone is actually hydroxy appetite, okay. It is not calcium carbonate. But whereas in the sea animals, it is the calcium carbonate, the echinoderms, it is the calcium carbonate which is the, the skull. That calcium carbonate remains remains solid there because the sea medium is alkaline, so it remains uh, a solid. Whereas if uh, we had calcium carbonate as the skeletal, then with one muscle activity, our all our bones would actually dissolve and we would become we would collapse to the ground. So to prevent that, all terrestrial animals, all these things, they started developing hydroxy appetite as the actual uh, mineral of the bone. Except in one place it has not got replaced and that particular place is the inner ear. Calcium carbonate remains as the uh, thing. And that is actually subject to all these acid-base acid uh, imbalances. So it could be obstructive sleep apnea. It could be a person who has been come out of the ICU. We, need, we see so many people who have come out of the ICU developing BPP. So after a lot. There are people who just because of prolonged bed, bed rest in one particular place also they do. In that case maybe it is a person who is moving around, the clump does not form. They are coming, particles are coming, but they don't form a clump. They are moving around. Okay. Whereas in a person who has been bed rest for, you, you see so many people with hip uh, surgery, knee surgery, whatever it is, they have undergone. And then post surgery, they get up. On the first time they get up, they have a BPP. So, so many things are there, underlying causes. But when it comes to the specific question of recurrences, two things as of now, I actually started believing is, Recurrent BPP in the end, I always look and treat for migraine. In the elderly, I look for uh, atherosclerosis and underlying cause. We no need to do anything for osteoporosis or vitamin D because they do I used to, at one point of time, I used to give a lot of vitamin D. I used to give a lot of vitamin D. But then later on, I really stopped because irrespective of whatever the patient comes with, most of our, I have never seen a normal vitamin D report so far in a person who has not been treated. Uh, to the extent that I started using vitamin D as a test, like there are some people who want something abnormal to batao. <laughs> so for them, like, there is one test I know will come abnormal. Okay. So somebody is looking for something abnormal, then vitamin D is the test. So I have never seen a person who is not been treated for vitamin D who comes with normal levels of vitamin D. So, so I used to give, there was one point. If you see my prescription, say, three, four years before, Every patient would go with the sachet of uh, this thing. But later on, I think, they, that, uh, I have not noticed much of difference, either in preventing recurrences or this thing, so that practice has gone off. So, uh, but magnesium is one thing now I am using, day in and day out. Magnesium is one thing. In fact, now, for me, migraine treatment starts with magnesium. And uh, drug comes later. Is it a break time now? Yes, today. Okay. Thank you. 
but not a must in every picture. Okay. Hi sir, you should understand. Just two two pillows. Keep the head up in cases of prostate canal. Don't step on the effective side. Ah, जब आप जो problem से मैंने सुवार होना थी. Don't turn your head up, down or excessive neck movement. बहुत नहीं जरूरत नहीं मारवाना. वो वहाँ को नहीं बनाना वो ऊपर नहीं जो बनाना. Good. Uh, what is the success rate of implants in your practice years? Close to 80 percent. Okay. Uh, uh, if first implants fail, then what you will do? When you call the patient for follow up. So my typical advice is that once I've done a tablet, I will recheck after some time if it has been uh, successful. I tell the patient you will. Sometimes uh, immediately. Yeah, yeah, after ten minutes we'll after recall. After ten minutes you will. Uh, recall. You will do the dig solve again. Yes, very okay, nice. Solve. If it is successful, I tell the patient. Patient will experience some amount of dizziness while he, from sitting to standing position, and on immediate neck movement. Because of the gravitational effect in the utricular macula, okay. this may persist for up to two days. After in the after 48 hours, that symptom should start dying off. A patient will be carried sir, a chakkar mati aur apne carried maathu baare baare lage chhene. Bol moment karu to thoro haltu hoye wo lage chhene. Wo bhi divas patient fariyat kare ke hi pehla patient ne inform kari deva nushe. After two days, the patient is advised to try and sleep in all positions practically possible that patient would want to do. And after 48 hours, if the patient experiences vertigo again in that same position, then the patient has to report back. Okay. If it please not work, then if one first it please is failed, then what do you do? Try and do a uh, call back again. See, because many a times it may not be a single particle. Revise the diagnosis means. It may be a conglomerate yes. of particles. Half of them may have fallen off. Half may still be there in the canal. So we might need to push them back. And even after the second one. If you have not gotten a, a gotten a good response, then revise your diagnosis. Okay, good. And uh, if again, if again police no misdiagnosis present, then you will do the second replay or go for another manual. Would preferably we try and do a second and see what. Many a times, what happens? Patients don't have a very flexible neck. So these are the patients in which we are not able to get the exact dependent position. Of that semicircular canal to actually move the particle one, or if the particle is too rigid, many times it doesn't move; it's too hard. So I've had this experience a couple of times. You know, we've done one, two, three. Patient is tired. It's a control hour. What I'll do is, okay, you take beta histamine for five days. Okay. Stop medicine for two days. Come back after a week. You know, the particle many a times we have this thing of self of in remission. So many a times these particles, many a times tend to loosen out or even fall. So if you are if you are tired or the patient is tired, and you are confirmed and sure that there is nothing else but BPT, then this, this is another strategy I have used in few patients. Yes, sir. What you explain to the patient before doing it, please. It please, कतार वाला सुन समझाओ मुझे. I ask patient that I will give jerk to your patient neck. Yes, so keep good. your neck very loose and flexible. Yes, very Don't good. do resistance while doing the implant. So it is very uh, only. Thing. Okay. And uh, another one is chakar uh, aushe. Yes. Chakar aushe ko ma ko lagana nahi hai. Aapne bo a practical point chhe. Bada aapne OP di na. Chakar aushe tamar ma ko lagana nahi hai. Um ma ko jerk thi fir please dog gili rakhwani chhe. Ab tu ane ek ek please na step ma tamar bo tu jawan chhe. Bhai please right kariye to ke baad usse mowe tamar. डॉग जमनी बाजू फेरवीस डॉग दिल्ली रात जो हूँ फेरो हो चुका चलो वन टू थ्री एम तरी ने पेशेंट ने डायरेक्ट स्टेप मार समझाओ तो जाओ उनसे क्या वे राइट फेरवीस वे लेफ्ट फेरवीस वो इम्पोर्टेंट चाहिए एनीथिंग सर यू वांट टू ऐड इन केस ऑफ वांट टू आस डॉक्टर सिंहियाज व्हाट टू डू इवन But if they are they are little bit motivated and they can do it, then you can teach them home simons and do home simons for next three to five days. Yes. And then if the symptoms don't relieve, really come back. Sir, so what about brand error of exercise? Brand error is better? brand error is when they stop responding. Okay, in the sense even for simons also they are not responding. And you know this patient is having. There are see there is one particular patient you know there is no way that whatever we try the particle is not going out. It looks like there are two constrictions and the particle is. Playing between the two constrictions in the canal, so it's not going to move out. So at least what you can do is 
and this pay, this is one patient who actually had a fall because of BP. Okay, so these people at least you should reduce the risk of fall. So what you can probably do for these patients is start off the day with five rounds of brand error, end the day with five rounds of brand error. What happens is if not anything, the particle will become loose. It will not be so effective in actually bringing about the. So start off the day with five, end the day with five. But these patients are rare, but they're knowing this that there is something that we can do for them also. Is helpful. Very good. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, like multiple canals, this should be have you encountered and how often? In the post trauma situation, multi canal BPPD is very common. Previously, what of so many events, somebody actually tells me multi canal BPPD, I actually uh, will uh, want them to send the video to me. Okay. Previously, a lot of multi canal BPPD, even today, a lot of things that are actually told as multi canal BPPD are bilaterally symptomatizing but unilateral afflictions. One of the commonest bilaterally symptomatizing unilateral affliction is lateral canal. Lateral canal we know so well that it is only on one canal but you get the mistake on turning to the right also on turning to the left also. Bilateral symptomatization is also known even in posterior canal. So we have to actually look at the mistake pattern, these things and then treat this thing. There are some rules that we are following. Okay. In when we actually see the patient, see three, four, five mistake buses that happen during the functional testing. Either it is torsional component or it is a horizontal component if you see. Whichever side you get the strongest beat, like if you get a right beating the strongest, among all, forget about with, uh, which position, whatever. Like you have got a sample, you have got five mistake muscles that you observe in this particular patient during different maneuvers. Among that five, pick up the strongest one. If the strongest one horizontally was beating to the right, right ear is only affected. If the strongest one torsional component was beating to the right, again it is the right side only, it is affected. So like that, this, this is happening. And uh, based on that, you treat that particular ear. And then again check. Now if the person on the opposite side is developing mistake mass of the opposite side canal, then it was really uh, multi-canal. Otherwise, it was bilaterally symptomatizing unilateral afflictions. Unless there is a trauma situation, otherwise you have to be really. And if you ask me, like most of the cases that actually are told as bilateral or whatever, unless there is a VNG documentation, there is a video documentation, all those things, okay, we need to first think probably it was like something, it was a bilaterally symptomatizing, which, which was felt as actually both sides affliction, it is actually only one side. But in trauma situation, it is quite known bilateral. The other place where we see a lot of different kinds of mistake mass patterns depending on the positional test. If you are checking for horizontal, you may get. If you are checking for horizontal canal, you may get posterior canal type of mistake mass. If you are checking for posterior canal, you get lateral canal type of mistake. All different patterns. This is migraine. Again, this is migraine. Okay, and they respond very well to migraine prophylaxis. Next day you call them on all the mistake muscles. Very good. Now a second video. Anything anyone to what add? No. Sir. Yes. Uh, treatment for BPPV in child. Yesterday we yesterday we saw a video. That is BPVC. BPVC. Benign so paroxysmal in child. We should never confuse, in fact, that it, it should not have been that name, they should not have given that name, BPVC, because the name is so confusing. Yes. BPPV is different, BPVC is different. BPPV is positional vertigo, it is because of the debris in the posterior, anterior, lateral canal. BPV is like, BPVC is a short-lasting, spontaneous attack of vertigo. There is nothing wrong with the inner ear in person with BPVC. BPVC is a migraine type of phenomenon. It is a pre migrainous condition, I think. Uh, yes, uh, BPPV patient is going to be able to get a patient's sub diagnosis. Diagnosis is going to be able to get a patient's sub diagnosis. Two things. Under 19, 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 under 19,
I'm I'm very categorical that there are three canals which basically give the signals of violence. And you must clean your image. No canal is not angry. Tell me. Both are there and demand. अरे हाँ बिल्कुल ही समझा भी तो हम कार्य करने था सर बट आप ऐसे नहीं समझो नहीं तो बिजी बात नहीं आवे तुम्हारे पास है वो इम्पोर्टेंट पॉइंट हमें लोग बिजी हैं तेरे के सुबह बिल्कुल नहीं आवे कि चक्कर नहीं आवे जस्ट जब नहीं चक्कर चक्कर सर नहीं बिजी बात आओ से चक्कर सर है मत समझो हम कैनल 90 डिग्री शे ये बैलेंस करी शक्ति नहीं पॉइंट सर फिजिशन तो बता मार्टिन ने लक्ष्य थे सर सर वो फिजिशन तो मार्टिन तू जरूर लक्ष्य चाहिए लिसन लिसन बराबर मैंने सेकंड टिंग शे एमआरई कराया पची एसी टका दर्दी स्वीकार ले जाए का धीमे धीमे मर्च है। बढ़िया जैसा मोटी सर के हम धीमे धीमे क्या मर्च है? नहीं नहीं सर इस बात से सर इस कोशिश हमारे सर अभी मैं तो मैंने यहाँ तो इमीजिएट रिजल्ट से वन मिनट ओनली। पर इलेक्ट्रेशन हमारे बाइस भी करें छे पर छत्ता भी बारे बारे धान शक्य था। आए थे सर मैं सर ने मोकल करें जो भी बिजली हुआ है। बहुत ही सुंदर है मजा now we will move to second video. Yes, patient, I will let them sue up or so. Yes, we got it and I died easy. 
बेनासर पेशेंट आवे सीवियर वोमिटिंग करतू हो ये बेजरा पकड़ी लावे हैं हाँ बेड़ा आपने सुपर है बेड़ा बेड़ा स्टेमेटी लाये हैं माफी दे ये एक आदमी फ्लूइड आपी है अने पच्ची वर्टिन बेकी थोड़ी आप पच्ची वोमिटिंग बंद था पच्ची वर्टिन नहीं आपी है अने पच्ची प्रोफाइलेक्सिस में सुपर वाकी है the patient has had a recent onset miniers. So, if a patient has had this symptom for last six months to one year. Okay. One. Number two, when I do VNG, in between the episode, VNG findings are almost known. Yes, yes. I like to do calorics for this patient. And if, for what? Just to see for the uh, strength of the labyrinth. <coughs> Until I start documenting weakness of the labyrinth, I would want to put this patient up on medical management, which would include a, a beta histine and diamox or acetazolamide. Right? Okay. Continue that for a period of at least three months, and then try and stop the medication to see if the symptoms bounce back. There are patients who will do well for one month, two months, and then again they will bounce back. So for them, the treat profile excess may go long. Or if the patient is responding, we'd like to stop and recheck when these episodes do come back. That is one. Number two, if this patient comes with vestibular deficits and the patient's hearing already starts dipping down, that is the time I start for transdentary gentamicin therapy for this patient. I would uh, not encourage these patients anymore to go ahead with a lot of profile access. I would rather want to uh, do a chemical This therapy. patient is only two episodes. Then... No, not for this patient. At least six months to one year, okay. patient Minimum duration is six months to one year. Patient has had continue with profile access. Minimum is in three months. This patient. Yes, yes. Six months. No, no, no. Three months. Three months. Okay. When when you will start the gentamicin? What is you, you prefer dexona or gentamicin interdimpenic? I prefer first dexona. Why? I think the gentamicin may worsen hearing loss. Oh. And also there is autoimmune etiology is there, so steroid is, I prefer steroid first, after that I choose symptoms. Okay. So, when will you choose? Clear-cut guideline, if you document weakness of the labyrinth on that side, that is the time you start thinking of gentamicin therapy, not otherwise. Okay. Oh, gentamicin ma keto SN loss thai se thai, document ke ro se kare? I am not documented. Yes. No, we have not come across any uh, loss. Yes, yes, yes. The patient has already had SN loss, boy, mild, moderate. So, if you have a gentamicin, you have a SN loss. Nothing. Nothing. So, if you have a gentamicin, if you have a SN loss, then you have a gentamicin contraindicated. So, if you have a SN loss, then you have a SN loss. So, if you have a SN loss, then you have a SN loss. That's right. Other patients. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, only thing is that whenever there is, things are not, Straightforward. So, I, in fact, Dr. Esh also started with this, emphasizing the word probable. Okay. Um, um, and uh, Dr. Hitesh also told about the duration. Okay. There is a reason why uh, the people actually come up with the minimum duration and the maximum duration. There is a minimum duration of 20 and a maximum uh, duration of 12 hours for uh, for uh, definite meniere's disease and 24 hours for probable meniere's disease. Okay. There is a reason why the minimum duration is also chosen. In the early stage of the disease, when the disease is still progressing, it is possible that some of these people have shorter, shorter durations. But when they say there is a lower cutoff, there is a because there are other diagnoses that come below the duration, which come under the lower cutoff. After two, more than 20 minutes, I am very comfortable with the patient. I really don't think in terms of TIAs, vascular causes, these things when it goes beyond 20 minutes, okay, at least going by the pattern. Though if you go by definition of TIAs, it can last for so long, but most of the patients whom we come across. The, among the people who have actually ended up having a stroke, these people, when they actually started showing up, their vertigo episodes have always been few minutes, very few minutes. These five, five minutes, seven minutes of vertigo episodes are really, and especially in the first six months, where the duration has not really been long enough. If the duration has extended more than two years, I am very comfortable even with short duration vertigo also that I am not looking at a vascular etiology. But when the, when the overall history is less than six months, 
especially in a middle-aged person with possibly vascular risk factors, all these things. Okay, even in a person with monosymptomatic vertigo with no other brainstem signs, I would really be little okay, skeptical about. I'll always keep watching, like maybe one. Okay, I'll ask for more more emphatically for other or diplopias, dysarthrias, even if they are not there also, I am inclined to start these patients on Ecosprin at least for some days. Okay, this is what. We have had patients like this who actually, who have been started on Ecosprin, then Ecosprin have been, has been stopped and then patients have ended up in stroke. So, this kind of thing has happened. So, this duration, there is, there is a reason why that lower cutoff is there. So, because the lower cut, it is below the lower cutoff. We have to be a little careful. But in this patient, I am a little more comfortable. Reason is, it is not just monosymptomatic vertigo. In addition to vertigo, there seems to be ear block, there seems to be tinnitus, at least what I have followed. Yes. So, maybe I am a little bit more comfortable. Even if it was monosymptomatic vertigo, I would be even more comfortable. Okay. Yes, I will add a word or two on TIA. You see, when we were students, we were taught that alone vertigo, cannot be a manifestation of TIA. Yes. It has to have other symptoms of brainstem involved. Yes. Okay. But over a period of time, it has been found that it was wrong. Yes. A simple vertigo itself yes. can be a manifestation of TIA. Yeah. Very and, and if you don't take care or treat them as TIA, if you don't diagnose it, there are a good 35% chances of getting a stroke in next 2 to 3 months. So it is extremely imperative, particularly if a man is or a person is above the age of 50 with risk factors, just alone vertigo can be a differential diagnosis of a, a TIA can be a differential diagnosis. In this case, there is different duration of 4 years, which is not likely to be a TIA. But yeah, if there are flurry of vertigos in short period of time, in an adult or an elder, TIA should be a strong Sir, so how do you differentiate TIA from other vertigo in OPD? What is the examination point, important points? Examination will be normal because if the TIA has gone, there won't be any deficit. So everything boils down to history. If a TIA, like, like I said in my slide, we have to differentiate between an aura of migraine, TIA, as well as the vestibular kind of stuff. TIA is like this, the beginning. Beginning is all of us. Catastrophe. Migraine is slowly over minutes. It can go up to even half. And uh, the seizure is in between. It will be two to three minutes and there will be a Jacksonian watch. It will maybe it will start from leg to thigh to up, which will take around one to two minutes. So abrupt snap like symptom would be a TIA. Yes. Seconds to minutes would be a seizure. And larger time, that is 20 minutes, 30 minutes, would be more of a aura that you are testing your mind friends. So this duration, the onset, basically helps us to differentiate between this. Praise my friends, who some job operation, and many as not patient. Patient, you pass them up. Patient, one diagnosis confirmed, then you have to say some job. Okay, that our under the gun, no pressure, what do you use?
Anything, sir, you want to add in manuals? No, sir. So I'm just seeing how many cases we can finish. Maybe we can extend till uh, evening. <laughs> no, no, sir. No, no, one or two more. <laughs> Causes of recurrent vertex of all cases. Many years are recurrent, BPPV recurrent, but see. Most common causes of recurrent vertex of all. Migraine. Have you played this one? Yes. Three. 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 Most common in Vatshya, three. Migraine, BPPV and many years. The past is the more important thing. Puchma ni question nege. Pela kya rethi puchhi chakar aiva se kenya. Me bo important point chhi. Vestibular neuronite is generally recurrent na ho yam. And the same symptom has to be he is to able to reproduce the same symptom. Yes, yes. And there we go. Yes.
I did not understand what she was telling. So I want to be explained. Uh, it's not rotate. Occasionally rotate in vertigo. Most of the time blackening tendency to fall. No, no, what is the, what do you mean by blackening? There is a visual blackouts. Yeah. Yeah. Blackouts. 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 Visual blackouts. Yeah. Yeah. So visual vertigo. Okay. We current almost every day since two years. Okay. Headache since childhood. Our mother has also uh, headache. Family history. Has she has she fallen? No. 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 And then she's fallen. She was complaining of some throat symptoms. Throat symptoms, yes. She, she was saying, "Who pani bhiwa ni koshish karo, who tera pani na pisho." Yes. So how do you explain those symptoms? Some symptoms are ridiculous. Why she has no, those episodes of blackouts? Some symptoms black which are not very comfortable are one is blackouts. So, okay, the second thing is about if at all think trying to drink not problem that again goes to. A, a brainstem type of. Ah, uh, oh, sir, MRI was normal. MRI is normal. Yeah. So, sir, when do you call it brainstem aura or something like that? Brainstem. Normally, the aura precedes the headache. Here, there is no correlation. The aura comes and then it gets So, the history in a patient with migraine with aura would be that patient has an aura which gradually progresses over a period of 5 to 20 minutes followed by it. And then as that headache is migraine has over a period of several hours. Why I thought this is the vestibular migraine is that the definition criteria is that five attacks of this kind with past history of common migraine. And half of the attack should have one of the symptoms of migraine, which could be headache, which could be photophobia, photophobia, or nausea. So maybe he could have elaborated history more about the migraine and the association with this kind of vertigo. Would have stamped the diagnosis that this is vestibular migraine. But per se from history, it looks very much like vestibular migraine. And what is the explanation for the visual blackouts that these people have? There are so many patients in migraine complaining. Almost 50 percent, sir. Yes. So, did they expose the like magic passive? I would call it as dysautonomic rather than And how will we differentiate this particular type of visual blackouts from the transient visual obscurations which we see in idiopathic intracranial hypertension? They, they are totally different. Okay. First of all, uh, they are momentary. Mm -hmm. They won't have any vertigo. Mm -hmm. And their headache is persistent, it is not migraines. First of all, it is NDPH. Uh, that is newly diagnosed persistent headache. They won't have any history of past. So the history would go that they had headache for some time recent, in recent past. So the first thought comes with NDPH. Then followed by this thing, TVU. What you, what you have said is transient visual obscuration. That is TVU. And that is believed to be sign of his internal pressure. And that is associated with maybe vomiting. And another sign is the diplopia. That is because of the sixth nerve palsy. This is how we can get the case of raised intercal pressure. And on examination, basically, it is a fundoscope which tells that there is papilloidema. So this would be quite different from those records. This would be a little longer lasting. Yeah, longer lasting. Uh, yes, sir. And yes, we already discussed the treatment, so I will skip it. Uh, this is also some of the operation, if I sum up, yes, am I? Balance in a super, you need a little bit of a soja over a car, check your muscle session. I don't know if you want to know the current one. Very good. Can you see that? Very good. Can you see that? Migraine of ear. Migraine. What was it? Migraine. Fourth video.
I am just seeing the place where you are taking the history. If patient is telling year discharge, you will put directly on the table and operate. <laughs> <laughs> This microscope is for only sex and years. Okay. <laughs> it is like patient is lucky if he tells I am having vertigo because he goes to VN0. If he tells Khan Beta, so he goes to VN0. Sir, I am not using autoscope uh, since long. Oh. Only microscope. Hey, but why are you standing and taking the history? <laughs> uh, बिटवीन <laughs> 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 चक्कर आ चार पांच दिन चक्कर आ चार दिन से चार पांच 